Hey friends, this is my PMBOK 7th edition tutorial where we will review everything that you need to know about the PMBOK Guide 7th edition. Before we get started, I have a free gift for you. I created my own cheat sheet that covers the most important concepts from the PMBOK Guide that will help you pass your CAPM and your PMP exam. It's completely for free and you can download it at alvinthepm.com slash PM7. Now, we'll first go through the standard for project management because it explains the system for how value is delivered and the 12 principles that influence every domain. Then we'll go through each performance domain that makes a project successful, followed by how to tailor a project and the appropriate models, methods, and artifacts that you can use. So open up your PMBOK guide, follow along as we dive into the material for this video. I 100% recommend grabbing a physical hard copy of the PMBOK guide, and I'll include links and in everything that I talk about in the description bar down below for you to check out. As you watch this free course on the PMBOK 7th edition, leave me any questions and comments that you have. Let's build a community so we can help each other become certified project managers and pass our CAPM and PMP exam. Now, there are a few important vocabulary terms that you need to master, and that is the difference between a project, a program, and a portfolio. A project is any temporary endeavor performed to create a specific outcome, which could be a product, a service, or even a result. It's temporary in nature, which means that it has a planned start and a planned finish date to complete all the work that's required to produce that final product. A program, on the other hand, is one level above a project. It oversees related projects and subsidiary programs so that opportunities and benefits can be achieved holistically by working on everything as a whole. Now, when you take one step above the program level, then you have a portfolio which oversees the projects, the programs, and operations together as a whole for meeting the organization's strategic goals. Another way to think about this is that a portfolio combines different initiatives underneath one big umbrella. So to visualize these differences, let's use the example of manufacturing a product line of electronic tools. Each product would be its own project. The entire lineup of tools would then constitute an overarching program. So in this case, a program for the suite of electronic tools. The portfolio would consist of this program plus other projects, programs, and the operations that are needed to manufacture those product lines. The goal for every project that we manage must deliver positive outcomes and positive value for the organization itself. And it does that in the following ways. The first is creating a product, a service, or a result that satisfies a customer's needs. Second, by creating an impact on society. Third, increasing the organization's performance, productivity, or efficiency. And the last one, well, it's helping facilitate the growth of an organization to an improved future state. So when you look at all three levels from the project, the program, and the portfolio level, this is the organization system for how value is delivered to achieve the overarching business goals, objectives, the mission statement, and of course, operating within the constraints of the organization's governance, structure, and external environment, which could be tied to some of the regulations from the government and the outside agencies. So to maximize the value that we deliver through our projects, it's very important that we optimize how information flows up and down that organizational ladder. It starts top down, first with management, who determines the organization's strategy, which in turn influences how portfolio are managed and what specific outcomes that the organization wants to achieve. We execute our programs and our projects to produce tangible deliverables, which are sustained in the long run by our organization's operations. We communicate that information back up the organizational ladder so that leadership can make the right decisions about strategy and how to pivot the organization. So as you can see here, it's a continuously ongoing cycle. Think of it like the circle of life from The Lion King, if you've ever watched that Disney movie before, but it's instead applied to organizations where information is always flowing back and forth across the organizational ladder. With this informational process flow in place, organizations also have their own governance system that establishes how projects are managed, how decisions and changes are made and approved, and of course, 
how issues and risks are controlled. Now, if this sounds confusing, just think of the organizational governance as the organization's procedures and processes that we must follow to make decisions, escalate to leadership, and to manage our projects and programs effectively. So while it's very important that projects deliver as much value as possible, there are eight factors that we need to manage if we wanna maximize our project's likelihood of success. The first is coordinating and overseeing everyone's efforts to complete the project's work. The second is creating the opportunities so we can obtain customer feedback on the product that's being created on a regular basis. Without clear direction from the end users, you're not gonna be able to build a product that satisfies the customer's needs. So as a project manager, you need to provide support to your team by helping resolve conflicts, removing any roadblocks, facilitating everyone's growth, and holding everyone accountable for their work. For a project to be successful, you need to have a group of people who have the knowledge and the skill set to perform their work and also to apply their expertise to create the final product. To ensure that the right product is being built, someone on the team, which could be the product owner or even the product manager, they need to give business direction to the team into what are the most important requirements from a business value standpoint. The goal here is that you want to maximize the value of the product you're creating by building the features that deliver the highest value to the customer. And adding on to this, as a project manager, you need to spearhead the project's vision and you need to communicate across the organizational ladder why this project is so critically important to the organization's success. Because when you do this, then you're gonna be in a much better position to empower other people, negotiate and obtain the resources that you need to help shape decisions that will make the project a success. And the last missing piece here is the project governance. You need to create a system in place that defines how project decisions are made and approved, how information is communicated to all stakeholders, how leadership will be informed of your project's progress, and how issues will be escalated for resolution. Because projects operate inside of an organization, you also need to be mindful of any internal and external influences which could either positively or negatively impact your activities. Think of internal influences as anything which is inherent or internal to your organization. This could be your organization's process assets, such as templates, tools, procedures, and policies. Other examples include your company's tribal knowledge, AKA your know-how, your lessons learned, your organization structure, your culture, the technical skills of your employees, the software that you're using in your organization, and of course, the geographic location of all your employees. Does everyone work remotely across the country or in the same building as you? For external influences, think of things that are outside the control of your organization, which could be influences from your industry, the market, economic and political trends, or even rules and regulations from the government and controlling agencies. Adding on to that could be industry standards, the physical weather and environment itself. So that could be like a hurricane, a flood, or a tornado that might negatively physically impact your ability to do work. Now, before we go any further, the PIMBOT guide makes a very clear distinction between project management and product management that you need to be aware of. Project management is guiding all phases of the project's work so that your desired deliverables and the outcomes are achieved using a specific approach. So that could be waterfall, agile, or hybrid. Product management, on the other hand, is all about developing a product through its entire life cycle by linking the people, the processes, and the systems together. A product's life cycle is about the evolution of a product from ideation to obsolescence. It starts from infancy as a sketch on a piece of paper to the growth stage where features are created and developed. Afterwards, the product matures and it continues to be refined to meet the customer's needs. And lastly, the product retires due to a change in the market or even your customer's needs. A project's life cycle, on the other hand, is a series of phases that a project goes through from start to finish. So initiating, planning, execution, monitoring and controlling, and closure. By the way, if you're getting a lot of value out of this video, make sure to smash that like button to show me your support so I know that you like my content. So with this knowledge of projects, let's dive into the 12 principles of project management. Keep in mind that these principles are not prescriptive in nature and are instead meant to guide your team's behavior 
when we're executing a project. The first principle is to act like a steward. What that means is you wanna act with integrity, care, and trustworthiness, and to strive for compliance with the latest rules and regulations. Are you someone, are you someone who acts honestly and to the highest level of ethics and standards? Do you serve as a role model and a trusted authority figure for other people? And do you also act in the best interest of your project success? The second principle is to foster a collaborative environment for your team to grow. And we do this by considering three factors. The first is considering your organization structure and delineating everyone's roles and responsibilities so it's clear who is responsible for performing what work. Think of this as the governance with how teams collaborate. How is everyone assigned to a project and how frequently will the team meet to review their work? The second factor is creating team agreements which establish what the operating conditions will be for how the team respects and works with each other. The third factor is creating the processes that are used to plan and complete the project's work. These three factors create a culture that allow individuals to collaborate and share a free flow of information. The goal here is not to create a dictatorship-like environment, but one where everyone feels empowered to make their own decisions so that they're held accountable and responsible for their work. The third principle here is stakeholder engagement. What that means in a nutshell is proactively engaging stakeholders throughout your entire project's life cycle so that the right value is delivered to your organization and your customers. Something to keep in mind here is that a stakeholder can be anyone who is affected by the project and they're classified based on their interest, influence, and impact level. And that's what I call the triple I factor. Stakeholders can either have a positive or a negative impact on a project. For example, the schedule, budget, requirements, and definition of success. So it's in our best interest to identify stakeholders as early on as possible and to focus our efforts on those who have a high influence level to minimize any negative impact on our success. The key here is to create a communications management plan so you know what's the best way to engage the appropriate stakeholder. How often? When should they be reached? And what is the best type of medium to communicate with them? The fourth principle here is focused on delivering value and making sure that this value aligns with the expected outcomes from your business case. This document describes three core areas, the business need, the justification for why we're pursuing the project, and lastly, the business strategy. Why are we pursuing the project? What's our strategy to realize the intended business value? And what will our ROI or return on our investment look like? The fifth principle is managing your project's interactions with other dependencies and breaking it down like a complex system that has its own internal moving pieces. For example, let's say that you're managing a program to develop a complex electric car. There's so many projects taking place simultaneously which need to integrate on a daily basis. So as a project manager, you need to understand how these separate projects integrate together so that the separate components being developed integrate successfully and deliver the right functionality. So to adopt a systems level of thinking, be aware of internal and external factors and always think from a big picture, AKA the 100,000 foot level. How does this support other projects taking place? And what other dependencies does this rely on? When we can understand the interactions with other projects, we can exploit opportunities or even prevent huge threats that could impact the entire program. By the way, make sure to smash that like button as we go into principle number six, which is all about being a leader and tailoring your leadership style so it fits the situation at hand. A leader is someone who influences motivates and directs people towards one goal. So to be an effective leader, all you gotta do is demonstrate that you have a vision, that you're someone that others can trust and rely on, and that you can empathize with the people on your team. Be the person who has good character and that you understand what inspires and motivates each person. And of course, you never wanna act selfishly. You should always act with honesty and integrity. One thing to keep in mind here is that a leader is not the same thing as having authority. 
Having authority means that you have a position of control in an organization based on your job title. So for example, senior manager or director or senior director. So to best lead a team towards success, demonstrate leadership qualities. Don't just be an authoritative figure just because, but be able to influence them towards a unified goal. Principle seven is to tailor your approach for managing a project based on the context that you're working in. In other words, you don't need to use every single tool and artifact that's listed in the PMBOK guide. Tailor your approach based on your project's background, the complexity, the number of stakeholders involved, and the structure of your organization. Try to keep things as efficient as possible so there's no need to overwhelm or even complicate things. The emphasis here is use a just enough approach to achieve your project's outcomes. To tailor your project, follow these three steps. First, select what approach you'll use. Will it be agile, waterfall, or hybrid? Then select the artifacts and the documents that you'll use to manage your project's work. And then collaborate with leadership and your team to define what processes actually make the most sense to use. Principle number eight is to build quality into your processes early on. That way you're focused on creating a product that meets the requirements and the needs of your customer. Ask yourself, does it meet its acceptance criteria and is it fit for use? We evaluate quality on the product through inspection and testing activities and process quality through audits and process reviews. So by building quality activities into our project plan, we're preventing major defects from being built into the product and we're making sure that the right product is being built for the customer. The next principle is being able to navigate the complexity that's involved with steering your team towards success. For us to understand complexity, we need to define what it means. Anything that's complex is pretty much difficult to manage due to the uncertainty or the challenges with using a new technology, the number of interaction with so many people, and the surrounding environment. While we can't control how complex something is, we can focus our activities towards decreasing the severity of the impact. And to do that, we can leverage lessons learned from similar projects be willing to experiment and fill faster, and of course be willing to adapt and be flexible with our project plans. Principle number 10 is all about managing risks, developing risk responses or risk mitigation plans, and always being proactive to maximize positive risks, also known as opportunities, and decreasing the likelihood and severity of negative risks, which are known as threats. There are two key terms related to risk management that you need to know. The first is risk appetite, which is the level of uncertainty that someone is willing to take to receive that reward. In other words, think of it this way. Are you more risk averse or less risk averse? And the second term is the risk threshold, meaning how far can the team deviate from the accepted goal? For example, a threshold surrounding a budget of $100,000 plus or minus 10%. The next principle is focus on being as adaptable and resilient as possible so you can recover from issues and pivot quickly when your environment is continuously changing. Don't forget that projects never go as planned and will require adjustments along the way. So it's very important that we're always learning from our past mistakes, incorporating short feedback loops to iterate on proof of concepts and finding ways to obtain customer feedback as early on as possible. Instead of focusing on developing very in-depth and very detailed project plans, focus your team on the outcomes that need to be delivered. Learn to balance being quick versus always being 100% stable. Now, principle number 12 is being someone who enables that change to achieve a desired future state. In other words, be a change agent that engages your stakeholders and motivates them early on. You're going to gain everyone's support and buy-in to enable the growth so your organization can evolve to the next level. It's very important to keep that in mind that you do not want to force too much change in a very short period of time because this may lead to a huge amount of resistance and fatigue. Change can happen internally forming your organization to fill a gap or even address a need or externally due to changes in technology or regulatory standards. So as project managers, we need to be aware of who our stakeholders are, how risk averse are they, 
and what kind of culture does our organization have? To be successful with implementing change and to gain everyone's buy-in, you need to be the leader who communicates the vision across all levels of the organization and you need to share how this will benefit them. All right, it's time to dive into the eight performance domains of the PMBOK guide, but I'm just about to head out for lunch, so I'll see you back later. All right, we just grabbed lunch and we're going to talk about the first performance domain of stakeholders. To achieve your project's desired outcomes, you must continuously engage and grow your relationships with your stakeholders. A stakeholder can be anyone that's inside or outside your organization who is affected by or who may influence your project. So that could be the project team itself, your organization's leadership team, and outside suppliers and customers who will use your final product. To be successful, it's not enough to have just the technical project management skills. It's even more important to be well-versed in your soft skills. So think of that in the following buckets, communication, leadership, emotional intelligence, conflict resolution, and active listening. There are six steps that you need to do to engage your stakeholders throughout your project's life cycle. Number one, you want to identify your stakeholders, anyone who can be affected or influenced by your project's objectives. Who is on your team and who will be the customers who will use your end product? Second, understand what are their needs and their interests. Go a little bit deeper now and analyze each stakeholder using a few of the following considerations. What's their interest level, influence level, impact, values, and beliefs? Document this in a stakeholder register and make sure that you do not share this with anyone and that you keep this confidential for your eyes only. Next, prioritize the stakeholders who have the highest level of influence and interest level in your project. Is there anyone, and I mean anyone, who is not supportive of your project that you might need to quote unquote win over. Remember that it's your goal to keep these folks highly engaged and satisfied with your project's progress. After you've prioritized your list, you actually need to engage them with their preferred communication approach. Depending on whether the message is formal or informal will determine the approach that you use. But let's break it down at a high level so you can understand how best to communicate with your team. There are two types of communication. You have verbal and written. If you're communicating verbally in a formal approach to leadership and management and your stakeholders, you can deliver your message pretty much using presentations, technical reviews, and in-person discussions. But if it's something that's a little bit more informal, then you can use hallway conversations or just in general chit chats during lunch that happen on the fly. Now where things get really interesting here is when you use written communication to deliver your message. For me, any time that is tied to something that's project related or an important decision that needs to be made and approved, I personally like to have everything documented 100%. So there's complete traceability to who said what and when it happened. Always CYA, AKA cover your because you never know when something might come to bite you later down the road. And trust me, you guys, it's not gonna feel good whatsoever. So written formal communication methods could be done using reports or project documents. More informal approaches would be through instant messaging and emails. Now, with any communication approach, there is a continuous feedback loop. First, did the person that you're speaking with receive the message? Second, did they actually understand what you said? And lastly, are there any minor details that the person needs to further communicate and understand? If you missed any of these steps, your message might be misinterpreted or unclear, and that's honestly the last thing that you wanna do. So always confirm that the person you're speaking with aligns with the message and understands what their assigned action item is. The last step with engaging stakeholders is monitoring their power and their interest level and seeing if your engagement strategy is working or if it needs to be changed. The ultimate goal here is to positively engage stakeholders throughout your project's life cycle and to get their feedback continuously and understanding if they're satisfied with the deliverables that your team is creating. To make sure that you're engaging your stakeholders in the most effective way, ask yourself the following questions. First, 
Am I positively creating relationships with my stakeholders? Second, are my stakeholders aligned with my project goals or have there been so many changes to the project scope, schedule, and budget that no one seems to really be aligned with my vision? And lastly, are my stakeholders satisfied with the work and the deliverables that we're creating? Or am I just experiencing a lot of issues with certain individuals? If you're getting a lot of value out of this video, make sure to smash that like button to show me your support and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. All right, so we'll move on to the second domain, which is for the project team's performance. How do you build a team that is high performing where everyone takes the lead and has full accountability and ownership with getting their work done? To understand how to create a winning team, we need to understand the difference between management and leadership. They're often used interchangeably, but they're actually not synonymous with each other. Management focuses on making sure that the project's goals are being met by following the organization's processes. It's very direct, primarily based on positional power with a huge emphasis on control, accepting the status quo, and following all the systems and structures that are already in place. How are we going to do it and when will we get it done? Leadership, on the other hand, involves working with your team by guiding, influencing, and collaborating with them. So it's more focused on building relationships with people, inspiring the trust, and asking what are we doing, and understanding the why behind our goals. Leadership is focused on the horizon, so making sure that we continuously innovate and challenge our status quo and doing the right things. I'll put on the screen here a table showing the clear differences between management and leadership. So feel free to take a screenshot right here so you can reference that down the road. There's a clear separation and it's super important to understand this difference. In some organizations, management might be centralized where accountability is designated to only one person. In other organizations, management might be shared or distributed among the team. For example, with agile teams, the team self-manages and self-organizes to complete their work. One specific leadership style that the PIMBOT guide emphasizes is servant leadership, where you focus on understanding and serving the needs of your team. A servant leader promotes a self-organizing team and their independence so that literally everyone feels like they have ownership and they can make their own decisions. If you see any questions on your PMP or your CAPM exam about servant leadership, just remember these three things. Servant leadership is focused on encouraging the growth of other people. Second, it's about shielding your team from outside influences so they can get their work done. And number three, it's about being the leader who steps in and helps remove any roadblocks they're experiencing. It's also important to understand what factors set up a team's development for success. The most important one is establishing the project's goals, guiding the team, and making sure everyone is aligned and motivated towards this mission. The second is defining expectations for everyone's roles and responsibilities. Is it clear what each person's job is and what they'll be held accountable for? The third factor is establishing the team's ways of working and operating conditions. This could be done through a team charter where you specify how the team will communicate and meet on a day-to-day -day basis and what the pathway will be to escalate issues. Now, the last factor is always striving to improve as a team and discussing lessons learned. Where are we performing well and what areas do we need to improve? Integrated into all of this is the team's culture. It's our job as project managers to build a safe and trusting environment. It's very straightforward to do this, and I like to break it up into seven buckets that you need to hit if you want your team's culture to thrive. The first is always celebrate and recognize your team's biggest accomplishments. This seems like it's a no-brainer, but all it takes is one quick shout out at the beginning of a meeting or an email to highlight your team's biggest wins. It shows that you appreciate everyone for their work and is going to encourage them to bring their A game and to do even better work. The second one is having the courage to challenge ideas and be open to experimenting new approaches. The third is to be transparent with how you communicate to others. The fourth is be someone who acts with integrity and is always honest with how they act. Remember, 
People want to follow someone they admire and whom they can trust. So you want to communicate with 100% transparency, even when it includes bad news, and you want to be as accurate as possible when you're sharing that information. The next bucket is to always show respect for other people. Never, never talk down to other people, regardless of their job title. The next two buckets kind of go hand in hand, but it's to support the team through the ups and the downs of a project. Focus on having dialogue even when there's conflict because you want to actively listen to the people you're working with and to collaborate to find a win-win situation. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the whole goal for this performance domain is to create a high-performing team. So when your team shows the following characteristics, then you're on the right track. First, recognize others for their work because it reinforces positive behavior. Second, build a shared understanding of the mission and the project's objective. Does everyone understand why we're working on the project and how it will impact the company? Third, create a sense of shared ownership. Does everyone feel like they have a stake in the game and that they're held accountable for their work? Number four, does everyone feel like they can trust each other? In other words, everyone should be willing to go above and beyond to make the project a success. Number five, is there open communication with everyone? And is there a free flow of information so that collaboration is 100% natural? And this leads into number six, have silos been broken down? We don't want cross-functional teams to not talk to each other just because they work in different departments. The next two go hand in hand and it's to be flexible and to have resilience so the team can recover quickly when an issue occurs. And lastly, does the team feel empowered to make decisions? If you said yes to any of these questions, then you have a high-performing team. Now, getting everyone to this level requires different leadership skills, but honestly, it's gonna take some time, especially when you look at the different stages of the Tuckman ladder, right? But to facilitate your team's growth, you'll need to demonstrate four key characteristics of a leader, specifically being a visionary, a problem solver, a motivator, and someone who has leveled up their interpersonal skills. So let's go through each one. A visionary is someone who knows how to inspire and motivate people. You should literally be able to write a clear vision statement that describes the purpose of a project, what criteria will make the project a success, and what the future state will look like when the outcomes are achieved. Here's an example of a vision statement. Launch a new product to market by end of 2025 that is reliable and inexpensive, which is expected to generate 150% more sales to the organization's revenue. As a problem solver, you collect and you analyze data and you apply reasoning to make the best strategic actions that move the team in the right direction. As a motivator, you understand the internal as well as the external factors that motivate a person. Intrinsic factors are literally what it sounds like. It comes from within, such as wanting to make a difference in the company, having a sense of belonging in your team, and just feeling accomplished. Extrinsic factors could be tied to an external reward, such as a monetary gift or praise. And the last characteristic of a great leader is someone who excels using interpersonal skills with emotional intelligence, making decisions, and resolving conflict. Now, I like to think of emotional intelligence as how skilled are you at understanding your own emotions as well as the emotions of other people? For example, are you good at quote unquote reading the room when you're meeting and talking to others for the very first time? I like to break up emotional intelligence into two categories, yourself and others. So for yourself, do you have self-awareness of your own emotions and your strengths and your weaknesses? Do you know how to self-manage your feelings and how you physically act? For others, are you aware of other people's feelings? How good are you at reading body language and nonverbal sides of communication? If you're talking to someone and they have a serious look on their face with their arms crossed against their chest, odds are they probably don't wanna to talk to you. So make sure you know how to read the room. And lastly, how good are you with managing other people and building relationships? This is what I call your social skills 101. And it will be put to the test as a leader since you'll be meeting new people on a day-to-day -day basis and trying to win them over to support your vision. 
In terms of making decisions, this can either be done by one authoritative person or as a collective group, so you gain the buy-in that you need from different people, which helps build the traction and the support you need to take action. Sometimes, literally all you need is to leverage your team to make the best decision possible because you simply won't know the answer as to what design, what material to use, which vendor to select to manufacture the product, or what type of tests should be performed to validate the requirements. The goal here is to make decisions as fast as possible while still leveraging the knowledge from your team and the subject matter experts in a respectful manner. Some techniques that you can use to individually brainstorm a bunch of ideas first and then vote with your team are the fist of five voting or what's known as wideband Delphi estimating. The next characteristic of a great leader is conflict management. Since conflicts happen all the time due to constraints in our projects, scope, schedule, and budget, we need to drive win-win collaborations that lead to better outcomes. To do that, Focus on solving problems and not focusing on the people as the root cause of a problem. Do not blame people for the issues and instead focus on how the issues themselves can be resolved. You need to be persistent with making progress towards your future vision and creating a safe environment where everyone can communicate their thoughts. Now, we've went over all these factors that can help you build a high-performing team. It's going to be up to you to tailor the way that you lead your team based on the project itself and the organization that you work for. Just ask yourself the following questions. Does everyone understand the purpose of the project? Does the team feel like they contribute and that they have a role in making the project successful? And does everyone trust each other and feel empowered to make their own decisions? If the answer is yes to these questions, you're on the right path to creating a high performing team. Now let's move on to the third performance domain, which is using the appropriate development approach, delivery cadence, and project lifecycle phases to develop and deliver your product to the customer. Now there are a few key terms that you need to know. The first is the difference between a project lifecycle and cadence. Now, a life cycle is the group of phases that a project goes through from the beginning to the very end. And each phase is a collection of activities that results in completing a final deliverable. A cadence, on the other hand, is related to the rhythm and the frequency that activities are performed throughout the project. For example, how frequently is your team meeting together to review and complete their work? Now, when you think of development approach, I want you to think of an ongoing spectrum, okay? On the left-hand side, you have predictive, and on the far right-hand side is adaptive, and right in the middle is hybrid. As you gradually move from the left side to the right side of your spectrum, your development approach will become increasingly more adaptive and therefore both more iterative and or incrementally based. A predictive approach, also known as a traditional waterfall approach, is the one that we're all familiar with where we do an, a hugely amount of planning done up front before any work starts. It's called waterfall because each phase happens one after the other and each phase must finish before the next one starts. So for example, let's say that you're building a house. The actual construction of the house can only start after the entire design is completed and all feasibility testing activities were successfully completed. And the final result is that the project's deliverables and the final product would be delivered right at the very end to the customer. So it's literally one single delivery at the very end. Now it's best practice to follow a predictive approach for projects where your requirements are not expected to change very frequently. If there are any changes, let's say that new requirements need to be added onto your product design, then these would need to be approved through change requests using a formal change control process. For example, in this predictive life cycle, we have six steps from feasibility all the way to project closure. In the first step with feasibility, we're conducting feasibility studies using prototypes to determine if the project is truly realistic and if we'll be able to achieve our projected goals. In the next two stages of design and build, we're developing and we're physically constructing the product while integrating quality-related activities into the process. During the testing stage, 
we're performing our final quality test and we're reviewing the final product with our customer before it officially goes live and it's accepted by our customer base. In our second to last stage, that's when we deploy our product and our product deliverables to the customer. And afterwards, that's when we formally close out our project and we transfer the product to operations, release any team members from the project and archive our lessons learned into our organization's repository. Now the adaptive or the agile approach on the other hand, it's the complete opposite of the predictive approach. It's a complete 180 flip because you're using this approach when requirements, they're not 100% locked down and they're probably, they're probably going to change over the next few months or throughout the entire project's life cycle. Being adaptive means that you use incremental and or iterative approaches to develop and deliver your product to the customer. For an iterative approach, the deliverable that's created after each iteration should have enough functionality and features to be considered acceptable and in usable condition by the customer, what's also known as the MVP or minimum viable product. So for example, let's say that your goal is to create a painting. The first iteration would be an artistic sketch. The second iteration would be a sketch with the first layer of colors. And the third iteration would be the final painting with all the layers of colors and embellishment. So as we can see here, each iteration results in a minimum viable product that has enough features that can be considered usable by your customer. Now for a strictly incremental development approach, a deliverable is created throughout a series of iterations. There would be three iterations of plan, design, and build, and this entire set of activities would repeat until the final product is ready to be deployed to the customer. Each subsequent build adds another layer of functionality onto the initial build, which altogether means that the final deliverable would be considered complete only after the final iteration. So going back to our painting example, each iteration results in one section being added onto the painting one after the other. And our last iteration results in the fully completed painting, meaning that the customer does not receive the finished product until the very last iteration is completed. So with these two in mind, if you're following an adaptive approach, let's say you're using the Agile framework, then you'll be using time box windows called iterations or sprints, which lasts roughly one to two weeks long in duration. And it's during this time box that you complete all the work that's required for the sprint. Before each sprint starts, your team defines and you prioritize the work for the next two weeks. The goal for each iteration is to create a minimum viable product that can be demoed to the customer with working features and functionality so you can obtain feedback faster and of course review what's working and what isn't working. After each iteration, you'll obtain customer feedback and reprioritize the backlog for the work that will be performed in the next sprint. And this cycle continues to repeat itself until a final product is delivered to the customer. So with this flowchart here, we see that a working product is delivered to the customer periodically throughout the entire project's life cycle, instead of delivering everything with a very big bang at the end. So with an adaptive approach, you're obtaining feedback as fast as possible before you're spending too much time and all these costs that are involved with creating a product that may not necessarily meet the customer's needs. The deliverable is delivered periodically to the customer on a fixed schedule, perhaps you know every two weeks based on the schedule of each sprint. Now the hybrid approach is a combination of both the predictive and the adaptive approach, and it's helpful when certain deliverables are modularized or they're developed separately by different teams. For example, let's say that you're developing a device which has both mechanical features and a software element. A hybrid approach would be completely perfect here because you would use a predictive approach to develop the mechanical housing of the device and then an agile approach to develop the software program that will be loaded into the device itself. Now with these three approaches, how do you know which one to use? Well, the answer is simple. It depends on your project's complexity, your organization's governance, and the product that you're creating. In terms of your project itself, the adaptive approach works very well for team sizes that are less than 10. Typically, seven plus or minus two team members with established roles for your scrum master, product owner, and members on your development team. 
If your goal is to deliver a working product very quickly and you have a limited amount of funding to create a prototype, an adaptive approach might work best for you. That way, you can develop a minimum viable product and release it to market very quickly and still obtain the customer feedback that you need sooner rather than later. Your organizational context also plays a huge role whether you'll follow a predictive, adaptive, or a hybrid approach. If your organization has many layers of reporting and it isn't a flat structure, then it's more likely that your project will follow a predictive approach just due to the sheer amount of approvals that need to go up the chain of command. If, however, your organization embodies self-organizing and self-managing teams with a very flat structure, then you're more likely to use an adaptive approach. In terms of the product that you're creating, there are eight different buckets to consider before you choose the development approach for your project. The first bucket is risk level. If your project has a lot of risk and you're planning to spend millions of dollars on the labor, development work, and materials, then it's very likely that you'll need a significant amount of upfront planning to mitigate those higher risks, and you'll probably use a predictive approach. However, if you can mitigate your risk by building a product in iterations and obtain feedback continuously, then you could use the adaptive approach. The next two buckets are regulatory and safety requirements. You'll typically follow a waterfall approach if it's mandatory for you to meet certain requirements before a phase gate finishes, especially from the documentation and testing standpoint. Bucket number four are change control mechanisms. If the type of product that you're creating makes it very difficult to manage and implement changes, for example, the construction of a home or a development of a mechanical product, then you're more likely to use a predictive approach. If you're developing a product that's maybe it's software related that can be easily tweaked or modified, you're probably going to use the adaptive approach because it allows for changes to be incorporated as long as it's prioritized in the backlog and agreed upon by the customer. The next two buckets are tied to the project scope and requirements. In general, if your requirements are very stable and they're not likely to change, then you're going to be using the predictive approach. However, if they're going to evolve over time because the market is continuously changing and the customer needs are unpredictable, then you're likely to use the adaptive approach. The other thing to consider here is the level of innovation. If your team is creating a new technology that's literally never been done before, your team doesn't have a predefined set of steps to follow, which means that you're going to be experimenting a lot and exploring new territory. So in this instance, it's best to use an adaptive approach so you can iterate quickly and obtain feedback from the customers as soon as possible instead of at the very end of a project. And the last bucket here is product delivery cadence. Will the product be delivered in one final piece at the very end? If so, then that's the predictive approach. Or will it be delivered in increments throughout a series of iterations throughout your project's lifecycle? In that case, then you're going to be using the adaptive approach. So as you can see here, there are quite a few variables to consider before you finalize the decision of whether or not you'll use predictive, adaptive, or hybrid to manage your project. Just make sure to ask yourself these following questions. First, is the development approach suitable for the deliverables that you're creating? Number two, do you have exit criteria in place before you transition from one phase to the next? And lastly, have you established a cadence for how your product will be developed, tested, and released to your customer? The next performance domain is planning and how it affects the following different areas. You have a schedule, budget, requirements, the team, communication, resources, and change control. And we'll go through all of this in much more detail shortly. Now for any project to be successful, it needs to be intentionally planned, but at the right level of detail to manage your project stakeholders' expectations and still enough to move forward and take action. You want to have that flexibility so you can adapt your plans whenever an issue arises or circumstances change. Here are a few variables to consider that affects how much planning you should do. The very first one is the project's development approach. If you're following a predictive approach, 
then you're going to have to hold in-depth planning discussions before any work begins. And as the project continues, then you'll progressively elaborate on your plans. On the other hand, if you're using an agile or an adaptive approach, then you'll do your planning at the very beginning of each iteration. The type of deliverables you're creating is also somewhat connected to the development approach. If you're developing a new complex technology or a software, then you're likely to use adaptive planning to evolve your design continuously based on your customer's feedback. Now, if you're developing a much more simple and straightforward product that follows a well-established sequence of activities, then you're gonna do all of your planning up front. Internal influences in your organization, such as the structure, processes or procedures and policies, all of that will also determine the level of planning and what type of documents that you need to create. External influences, such as the market or regulatory requirements, they can also influence the level of planning that you perform and how fast you need to complete your project. For example, if there's an extensive amount of regulations all around testing, then you need to perform your due diligence with planning up front to mitigate the risk of non-compliance and obtaining regulatory approvals. To better understand how we plan our work, we have to understand a few things with how we develop estimates for each of these following categories. First is the effort, or the number of labor hours that it takes to complete a task. Number two is the duration, or how long or how many days will it take to complete the work. Third is the cost. How much will materials and labors actually cost to complete all the work? And lastly, the resources. How many personnel and how many materials do we need? Now the PMBOK guide does a great job explaining the four areas of estimation that we need to consider. We have the confidence level, the range, the accuracy, and precision. Your confidence level, well that's pretty much how confident are you that it's going to take place in your estimated range. For example, you could be 95% confident that you'll complete the work in the next two weeks. Now for the range, think of this as the interval that your estimate will fall in. For example, obtaining parts from a supplier might take anywhere from eight weeks to 12 weeks to receive parts at incoming inspection. Another way that the PMBOK guide explains it is that when you first start your project, your estimated range will be much higher because there's so much uncertainty and ambiguity with the work itself. So maybe it'll be negative 20 to a plus 75%. But as you make progress in your project, your estimated range will become much more accurate and it'll narrow down to negative five to plus 10%. Accuracy on the other hand means how correct is your estimate? The lower your accuracy, the more likely that you'll have a wider range of values. For example, if you're playing a game of darts, right? You're going to be very accurate if you're hitting the darts right in the middle of the board. But if they're just spread out all over, then you're not accurate at all. Precision is the other term that gets confused with accuracy. In two words, precision means how exact your estimate is. For example, speaking in terms of minutes is much more precise than speaking in terms of hours. Going back to our example of a game of darts, if all of your darts are clustered together, then you're throwing them very precisely. This is really important to understand, so let me explain here. In my drawing that I'm showing right here, because all the darts are clustered right together and they're actually hitting the target, you're both accurate and precise. In my second drawing here, because the darts are around the target, but they're not relatively close to each other, you're accurate, but you're not precise. On the other hand, if your darts are way off the middle, but they're still grouped together, then you're precise, but you're not accurate. And lastly, if your darts are just randomly scattered throughout the board, then you're not accurate and you're definitely not precise. I hope that makes sense. Now, there are a few ways to document your estimates. You could use one single number, which is called a point estimate. So for example, task A will take 24 hours to complete. The second way you can do that is what's called a probabilistic estimate where you state a range along with its likely probability. The way you do this is either by running a computer simulation 
we're using a weighted average based on three outcomes, most likely optimistic and pessimistic. If you're using a simulation, then you'll need to know three things. The first is your point estimate with the range. The second is your confidence level, usually expressed as a percentage. And third is your probability distribution curve. For example, the construction of the main floor will take five months plus three months and minus two months with a 95% confidence level. And you'd also include a graph of the probability distribution curve. If you decide to calculate your probabilistic estimate using a weighted average, one common technique is by using a three point estimate formula with a beta distribution. The formula, which is also called the PERT formula, stands for Program Evaluation and Review Technique, and it's defined as follows. Your expected completion time or expected cost is equal to O plus 4M plus P, all of that divided by six, where O is your optimistic estimate. So in other words, if everything was ideal, what's the fastest or the lowest cost that we could have this completed? M is your most likely estimate. So in other words, if you had to submit only one estimate, what would that estimate most likely be? And P is your pessimistic estimate. What is the maximum amount of time or the largest amount of cost required to complete the work? There are a few assumptions that we make here. For the optimistic value, we're assuming that all required resources are available and all predecessors are completed per the plan. For the pessimistic estimate, we're assuming that many things will be going wrong and that this is the worst case and most conservative value. Personally, I'm more of a visual person who learns through actual examples. And since the PMBOK guide doesn't give you an actual example of how to do this, let me show you right now how to calculate it. Let's say that you have activity A with the following estimates. 11 days for the optimistic value, 15 days for the most likely estimate, and 19 days as the pessimistic estimate. Then the estimated duration with the PERT formula would be 11 plus 4 times 15 plus 19, and all of that divided by 6, which results in 15 days. To calculate the standard deviation, we use the formula pessimistic value minus optimistic value divided by 6. When we plug in those numbers, we get a standard deviation of 1.33. To calculate the variance, all we have to do is square the standard deviation so we get 1.33 squared, which equals 1.77. So now we've calculated that our expected duration for task A will take about 15 days plus or minus 1.33 days with a variance of 1.77 days. And when you plot your estimate on a distribution curve, it's going to look something like this. I like to draw out the lines for where each standard deviation is so you can visualize where each estimate would be. Now the other alternative with representing your estimate is either as an absolute estimate or a relative estimate. An absolute estimate is just as it sounds. You're using absolute actual numbers to quantify how long something will take or how much something costs. For example, it will take five business days to finish writing a test protocol. A relative estimate is when you give an estimate relative to another. So literally, you have a baseline for comparison. It's often used in agile projects when you're doing sprint planning and you're using a technique that's called planning poker to size up how much effort it takes to complete the user stories in one sprint. The other key term about estimation that you should know is flow-based estimation, which uses two concepts, your cycle time and your throughput. There are two very important terms that you need to understand, especially if you're dealing with manufacturing and operations. Cycle time is the actual total time that's spent working on or making a part that's measured from the start of the first task to the end of the last task. For example, let's say that you're baking a cookie that goes through five steps. Your cycle time would be how long it takes for one cookie to be made from when you gathered and started mixing the ingredients to when a cookie just finishes baking right in the oven. If you're in the restaurant industry, your cycle time could be used to track the time from when an order is placed to when a customer receives the meal. 
Throughput, on the other hand, is the number of items that a system can process in a given amount of time. Let's take our baking cookies as an example. Let's say that in one round of the entire baking process, which lasts about one hour, the baking process generates a throughput of 30 cookies per one hour. By the way, if you're getting a lot of value out of this video, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe for more videos like this. Now we've mentioned previously that planning affects these following areas. Let's first start out with scope and requirements. In predictive projects, we first plan out what the high level deliverables are, and then we decompose that into smaller, much more manageable pieces using a work breakdown structure. For example, let's say that you're developing a new software product. The first tier could include a project management, requirements analysis, design, development, and testing. For each of these buckets, we'll have the deliverables tied to each phase. Under design, that could be prototype design, architecture design, and system performance. And then the level underneath that, well, that would be the task to create those deliverables. For Agile projects, we'll break down the high-level themes of epics into features, which are then decomposed into user stories and other items in the backlog that are needed to create those features. And all of this ties into the next area of planning our project schedule. For predictive projects, this follows a simple five-step process. First, you have to break down and decompose 100% of your project's work into the activities for creating those deliverables. Then you place those activities in the correct sequence, which one goes first, second, third, and so on. Afterwards, you estimate what's required to complete each activity. How long will it take? What resources do we need? And how much costs are involved? Then we assign resources, both material and people, to each task. Once we do that, we can analyze and refine the schedule until it meets our desired timeline. If our schedule does not meet our expectations, we can either shorten or increase the duration of each task, or we can have the tasks be performed in parallel with each other. Two schedule compression techniques that we can use to meet aggressive deadlines are what's known as crashing and fast tracking. Crashing, all that means is you're literally shortening how long a task will take by literally crashing it by adding more resources and costs to complete it. For example, adding three more people to complete the physical labor of building a product. However, keep in mind that this does not apply to activities which are not effort driven. Activities which have fixed durations, they cannot be accelerated regardless of how many people you add onto it. For example, completing a test or holding training will always take a set amount of time. Make sure to also keep in mind the law of diminishing returns. Just because you're adding more people to complete the work may not always reduce the duration. It could work up to a certain point, but after that, adding people might actually increase the length of a task. All right, so the second schedule compression technique is what's known as fast tracking, which literally shortens the length of a task by having tasks be performed in parallel with each other, and it involves a key understanding of two terms, a lead versus a lag. A lead accelerates when a succeeding activity can start by having it begin before the predecessor finishes. For example, task two has a predecessor of task one finished to start minus three days, which means that task two has a finish to start dependency with task one, and it can start three days before task one finishes. So it's leading and starting earlier. A lag delays when a succeeding activity can begin. Typically, that's with a finish to finish or a start to start dependency. For example, task two has a predecessor of task one, finish to finish plus two days. In other words, task two cannot finish until two days after task one finishes and it's lagging. So when you're creating your schedule, it's important to understand the following dependencies internal versus external, and mandatory versus discretionary. External dependencies are outside the control of a project manager's authority. This is a little bit harder to understand, but 
Think of this as anything that's external to your project team that you have no control over. For example, obtaining sign off from the FDA on a regulatory submission before any development activities can begin or waiting for test results from another group before continuing on with the project. Internal dependencies are related to activities in the project itself and they're tied to bottlenecks or constraints that are within the control of the project manager or the team's authority. For example, the team cannot test the prototype until it's been designed by the engineers. Now, discretionary dependencies are established based on best practices from industry or even your organization, and they are at the discretion of your project team. For example, it's best practice to complete all electrical work before painting the wall. These are often more flexible and they can be modified as needed based on the needs of your project. Mandatory dependencies are 100% required for your project to be completed successfully, and they dictate what activities must happen in a specific order. Unfortunately, this type of dependency cannot be changed without impacting your project schedule or budget. For example, when you're building a home, you cannot build a roof without building the walls first. It just wouldn't be physically possible. For adaptive projects, instead of planning everything up front, we do incremental planning, which is just as it sounds. We break down our long-term planning into much smaller efforts, and we plan incremental releases of a product. For agile specific projects, we'll start by creating our product roadmap, which then drives what our high-level release will look like. These release plans are guidelines about which features will be implemented based on their priority and when this will occur in the upcoming sprints. The release date is estimated based on the number of sprints that you need multiplied by your team's estimated velocity. The release plan helps us plan which product increment or software version will be released to market and by what date. So from your release plan, you then have estimates for the number of upcoming iterations. This establishes your iteration plan and inside of this are the priorities for which feature will be developed through your user stories. This gets broken down further into tasks to complete each user story. Now, it's worth mentioning here that for agile projects, work is completed in what's called a sprint or an iteration, which is just a time box window anywhere from two to four weeks. It's up to the team to self-organize and self-manage their own work so that they can demo a working increment to the customer at the end of every iteration. Let's move on to the next planning area, which is for your budget. At the very beginning of your project, you develop cost estimates for each activity, which you aggregate all the way up across your schedule to form your project's cost baseline. When you combine your cost baseline with your contingency reserve to account for any risks and uncertainties, that is what's called your final project budget. The management reserve is separate from your budget and it's reserved for your unknown unknowns or any unforeseen work which is not within the scope of your project. In comparison, your contingency reserve is set aside ahead of time for the known unknowns. For example, implementing risk responses for potential rework or redesign due to field testing. The next area that you need to plan for is your team's structure. Your project success will be highly dependent on the skill set and the experience of your team. And that's why it's so important to negotiate and work with the appropriate managers in your organization to leverage the right resources to work on your project. If you can, have your team be co-located so that there's real-time osmotic communication and transparent communication with everyone. If it's more of a virtual remote team where everyone works globally, then you'll need to know how to set expectations and how to communicate using Microsoft Teams, Zoom calls, or instant messaging through Slack. Now the next planning area that's super critical to your success is communication. More than 90% of our jobs as project managers is just communicating with other people and making sure that they're receiving the information that they need. And that's why you need to create a communication plan, which addresses the four W's and one H, which is literally who, what, when, why, and how. Who will provide the information and who needs the information? 
what information needs to be communicated to each person and what is the best way to communicate it. Will it be through email, formal reports, or presentations? When is the information needed and why does this person need to know this? And lastly, how often, like what's the frequency that the information needs to be provided? The next area to consider with planning is resources. Think in terms of any type of resource which does not involve human labor. So that could be materials, equipment, software, and machines. For anything that would be procured with an external vendor, make sure that you perform a make versus buy analysis and that you evaluate each supplier that you'll be awarding the contract to. Your organization probably has their own predefined set of criteria to evaluate each supplier against. For example, quality, on-time delivery, performance, years of experience, and so on and so forth. And the last planning area is how changes will be managed throughout your project's life cycle. If you're following a traditional predictive approach, then you need to use a formal change control process where changes must be submitted using a change request form and be approved by leadership and the change control board. Now, if you're following an agile project, any changes to the requirements or the scope, they must be evaluated against the customer's requirements and be reprioritized in the backlog. So as you can see, there's quite a few things to evaluate when you're planning your project so that it's a success. Just ask yourself these following questions. First, as you're going through your project, is everything progressing on track relative to your baseline and your team's agreed upon success metrics? Number two, did you plan all areas of the project taking into consideration scheduling, cost, resources, scope, and quality? Number three, are you planning at the right level of detail? Fourth, did you create a communications management plan to make sure that you communicate the right information to the right person at the right time? And lastly, are you using a process to manage changes to your project? All right, so we captured quite a bit here today for the planning domain, and I need to take a quick break to eat some dinner. So we'll be right back. All right, so we are back and we're diving into the next domain, which is work performance. This is all about creating and managing your project's processes so that your team's performance is optimized as much as possible. This leads to so many benefits, such as effectively using your resources, proactively engaging all of your stakeholders, and managing your vendor relationships so procurement can be done efficiently. Now, there are eight big buckets that's involved with optimizing this entire workflow, and I'll show that on the screen right here. But first, let's dive into the first one, which is tailoring your processes to manage your project. Remember, your goal as a project manager is not to overwhelm everyone with all of these non-value added activities, redundancies, and excessive processes. Instead, it should be your goal to make things really easy for yourself and your team. Do your best to find ways to eliminate bottlenecks, remove non-value added activities, and just to make things more efficient, you can use lessons learned and retrospectives to find ways to improve as a team. You could even use some lean tools such as value stream mapping to identify what steps don't seem to make any sense and they're just wasting your time. If there's anything that you take away from this video, just ask yourself, is our time, our money, and our effort being the best spent doing this activity? Processes that you're following and setting up for your team, they should not only be efficient, but they should also be effective and comply with your organization's policies and any regulations. Now, the second area to optimize your team's work is by balancing competing constraints. This could include anything in terms of budget limitations, customer demands, or fixed delivery days from vendors, and adhering to governmental regulations. Being a project manager myself, it's all a balancing act and striving to do your best to satisfy what your customer needs are and still delivering the highest quality possible product that's possible. You will always be making compromises and sacrifices and trade-offs. And how you get to that end goal will always depend on how you prioritize your team's work, which leads us into the next big area. 
you need to focus your team on the long-term and the short-term goals. You're the one that's spearheading the strategic vision while everyone has their heads down working on their deliverables. It could be developing new software code, creating a test protocol, or even just analyzing data. You need to be the one who spearheads the vision and realigns everyone back to the goal. Be the force who monitors and checks on the health of the team. Is everyone still motivated and satisfied with their work? Are we prioritizing the right work that is the most important to the customer? And is everyone bringing awareness to any risks and issues which might derail the project? The way we do this is by honing in on our communication skills, which is the next area of this domain. 90% of our job as project managers is to communicate the right message to the right person. There's four simple steps to all of this. First, you need to collect the most important and most relevant information from in-person discussions or project syncs. Then you wanna share that information with the correct stakeholder per your communications management plan. Number three, you need to verify that your intended audience actually received and understood the message. And number four, touch base with your stakeholders to make sure they're staying engaged and address any questions or concerns they have. You don't wanna leave them hanging, all right? Now the next area that helps optimize your team's work is by managing your physical resources. You need an efficient process in place to plan, order, and track the procurement status of all your material. If you have to hold weekly touch points with your supply chain counterpart to hold them accountable, then do it by all means. Nothing is worse and I'm telling you from personal experience, but nothing is worse than finding out that one of your critical components will be delayed by four more weeks just because you forgot to follow up with a vendor. So this is definitely one area that you want to be proactive in. This ties directly to our next area, which is procurement management. This literally covers everything from procuring physical materials, supplies, and equipment, to requesting for physical labor and services. Usually across many organizations, and even based on my own professional experience, the project manager is not the one who actually issues the purchase order. This is typically done by your supply chain group. However, you do need to understand at a bare minimum the following concepts that's associated with choosing a vendor. The first step is by asking for bid documents from different vendors. There's the RFI, or the request for information. The second is an RFQ, or request for a quote, or you're asking for a solution based on a specific price. And the third is a request for a proposal, an RFP, which is used when you know exactly the type of solution that you're looking for, and you're hoping that the vendor is something that you can collaborate with and they can give you what you need. So once you obtain these bid documents, the next step is to hold a bidder conference to answer vendor questions and allow time for each vendor to provide their proposal. The goal here is you want to allow all potential vendors to have a clear understanding of what your requirements are what's being procured, and what exactly are you asking for? The third step is you need to evaluate the vendor against a specific set of criteria. For example, that could be supplier performance, quality, expertise level, on-time delivery rate, and pricing. After you review each supplier with your team against this matrix, you'll award the contract to the chosen vendor. But before you issue that PO with that vendor, make sure that the following documents are in place. A request for a proposal, an agreed upon statement of work, terms and conditions, and a non-disclosure agreement. Your NDA is especially important because you need to protect your company's confidentiality and intellectual property, especially if it's new technology that you're developing. Once that's done, then you'll integrate the vendor into your project plan and you'll re-baseline your project schedule and your budget. The next important area in the PMBOK guide refers to monitoring new work and changes. In a nutshell, this is all about managing scope changes to your project, whether you're following a predictive or an agile project. For predictive projects, changes to requirements and scope is only allowed after it's been approved through a formal change request. 
it's best practice to evaluate any new risks which may be introduced with this change. For Agile projects, any additional work must be prioritized in the backlog based on the value that's being delivered to your customer. And the eighth area that's tied to managing your team's work is optimizing the gathering and the sharing of knowledge and lessons learned throughout your entire project. It's very important to understand what's going well and what can we do better in the future. There are two key concepts to familiarize yourself with, and that is explicit versus tacit knowledge. Explicit knowledge is any information that can be easily expressed into words or images and quickly shared with other people. Tacit knowledge, on the other hand, well, that's the tricky part because this is the kind of information that is, it's a little bit more difficult to express in words because it's based on a person's unique experience, skill set, and values. However, you can get a glimpse into this by shadowing someone else's work, observing them, and their day-to-day -day, or interviewing them to pick their brain and just get a better understanding. So the big lesson from this work performance domain is the following. The more that we optimize our ways of working, the better that our team will be at delivering successful outcomes. If you're not sure, if you're on the right path to optimizing your team's work, just ask yourself these following questions. First, did you tailor the processes for your project and did you make sure that the steps are value added and both efficient and effective? Second, do you have a communications management plan in place to make sure that the right people receive the right information? Number three, are you using resources most effectively and do you have systems in place to track procurement with external vendors? Fourth, are you managing scope changes for your project, either with a change request process or a product backlog? And lastly, are you promoting opportunities for your team to learn continuously and get better as a team? Domain number six in the PIMBA guide is tied to delivery, which if I had to summarize it in one sentence, it would be this. Are we delivering value to our customers with the deliverables that we're creating? And is it meeting the highest level of quality standards? Delivery it's more than just creating a product that meets the project's scope. It's about exceeding your customer's needs and building quality into your process so we can realize our intended outcomes. And the way we do that is by delivering that value by creating products, services, or solving problems that will fix an issue. So there are three key areas to a successful project delivery, and that is value, deliverables, and quality, and you need to know all three of them. Let's first start with value, and we determine the value that our project will offer before we even authorize it, and this gets captured inside of our business case. Eventually, this justifies why is a project worth pursuing, and what would our ROI or return on investment be? Would we be in the negatives financially, or would this help increase the business's profit margins and increase our market share? Now, depending on which development approach that you use, that's going to determine when you're creating value for your customers. In a traditional predictive approach, deliverables are delivered to the customer at the very end of a project. In an agile or an adaptive approach, Deliverables are delivered to the customer continuously throughout the life cycle because the product is created in iterations, typically two to four weeks in duration. Now the second category to a successful delivery is the deliverables. A deliverable is any type of product. So that could be an intermediary version or the final configuration that the customer uses, which is an output from completing your project's work. To create your deliverables, you need to clearly establish three things, your requirements, your scope of work, and what the true definition of done is. To capture all of these requirements, there are three steps that you need to follow. First, gather requirements by interviewing your stakeholders and holding focus groups. Analyze the data and observe the process. Now, before you document your requirements into your requirements traceability matrix, make sure that each requirement addresses the following criteria. Number one, is it clear what its purpose is and does it avoid any confusion? Second, is it concise and consistent? 
Third, is it easy to verify that all requirements were met? And lastly, is each requirement traceable so that you can find it easily in the future and you can understand exactly what you're reading? Now, after you've gathered your initial set of requirements, you need to continuously capture requirements as they evolve throughout your project's lifecycle based on what your customer's feedback is. And for the third step, you need to manage all the requirements and set expectations with your customers to avoid scope creep. As your project requirements become defined, your scope also needs to be clearly defined. So anytime you think of requirements, you also wanna think of the scope of work that's involved because they literally go hand in hand. Before you do anything, do everything that you can to create a scope statement and have all of your key stakeholders agree upon it. What are the major deliverables and what are the agreed upon acceptance criteria that will make your project a success? If you don't set expectations up front, no one, and I mean no one's going to understand what it means to have a successful project. Both your internal and your external stakeholders will keep piling on more work after the other onto your project scope, which trust me you guys, you do not want to happen. So my advice to you is, Draw the line in the sand, create your scope statement with everyone's buy-in. Then afterwards, use a work breakdown structure to decompose your team's work into the appropriate work package level and then the activities to create that deliverable. If you're leading an agile project, then decompose your themes into epics, features, and then user stories. As I've mentioned earlier, it's very important that for each deliverable, you establish with your team what the following means. What's the acceptance criteria? In other words, what set of items must be 100% satisfied before the deliverable would be marked as accepted by the customer? Second, what is the definition of done? All that means is what is the set of criteria that must be met before a deliverable can be ready for a customer to use? And lastly, define your product's technical performance measures and specifications. If you don't know what you're building, then how will you know what to build? The PIMBOK guide also discusses a key concept called moving targets of completion. And this typically applies to projects where the market is always changing and products are released frequently, such as for the latest technological equipment or even software. And with this rapid pace of innovation, requirements will change very quickly. But unfortunately, this means that your project's definition of done will continuously evolve. And the further your goal keeps moving, the more that your definition of done will also keep shifting. And the PIMBOK guide calls this the quote unquote done drift. In other words, a project that's taking longer than expected to finish because the definition of done keeps on shifting. For example, let's say that you're leading a team to launch a new smartphone to market and you have a planned completion date by the end of Q4 this year. Unfortunately, competitor A launched their design in June with new features and capabilities. To keep up with the market and to be competitive, you have to redesign your entire product and incorporate these same capabilities which delays your product launch by three more months. Competitor B, they come right in and they launch that new design, which includes significantly more enhanced features. But unfortunately, you also have to keep up with these new trends. So adding these new features onto your product will take an extra two more months. So in total, instead of launching your company's smartphone by December, you'll finish launching it by May of next year. The added on extra months from January to May is what's called the done drift. Now, if you're managing a predictive project, I highly recommend that you control any scope creep by using a change control system so that all changes must be evaluated and approved by leadership before they're actually implemented. That way, you're not going to be blindsided. And the biggest reason why is that any changes to your requirements and your scope could significantly add months to your entire timeline and increase costs by more than double if you're not being careful. The third area for optimizing your product's delivery is quality. And as we've mentioned earlier, delivering a product to your customer, it's not just meeting your project scope and all of the requirements. 
it's also about meeting or exceeding the highest level of quality standards so that there aren't any issues, defects, or failures that the customer could see. We do our very best to prevent these quality concerns by setting our expectations up front and specifying what is our definition of done and creating a statement of work whenever we work with our suppliers. The other way that we mitigate these risks is by investing into our quality processes to meet these specific needs, which is also known as a cost of quality. There are four categories tied to the cost of quality, internal failures, external failures, prevention, and appraisal. For internal failures, the goal is to correct defects before the customer receives the final product. Costs incurred when the product does not reach these quality standards include these four areas. The first is scrap, when the product cannot be used or sold because it's not working properly and it has too many defects, cosmetically or functionally. The second kind is waste, when too much material is being stored in-house or there are non-value added steps being performed in a process. The next is rework, when additional work has to be performed to fix a defective product so it can meet a specification. And the final cost of quality tied to internal failure is failure analysis, a technique that's used to discover what caused the product to fail in the first place. The next category of external failure occurs when defective products are discovered after the customer receives the product. And unfortunately, the hidden costs that are associated with this can be extremely detrimental to the company and its reputation and even negatively impact its longevity and performance in the market, which could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, to the company itself. It can literally be that bad. For example, external failures could lead to product returns and having to deal with recalls and extensive investigations. Back in September 2016, Samsung had to globally recall 2.5 million phones for their Galaxy Note 7 after there were many customer complaints of overheating and exploding batteries and significant fire hazards. After a large amount of these reports, Samsung they had to stop sales and production of this phone, which resulted in their product recall. Luckily, they took corrective action, they had a press conference taking full responsibility, and they did extensive investigations to figure out what caused the failure. Other examples of quality costs due to external failure include warranty claims and having to replace products under a limited guarantee and performing repairs and services to fix malfunctioning products. The third category for cost of quality is prevention, which is about preventing and keeping quality issues from being created in the product in the first place. In other words, you're doing things right the first time around. Examples of how to prevent quality issues include building training processes and procedures so that your operators, they know how to manufacture and build a product correctly in a step-by-step -step sequence. Other ways are by creating robust quality plans for how the product will be inspected and tested and also by creating robust specifications that must be met before the product is released to market. And the fourth category for cost of quality is appraisal, which involves inspecting and verifying that your product meets specification. For example, performing audits to our processes and verifying that all the steps are being performed correctly. Another example is physically inspection of the part to a drawing and verifying that every dimension and all the physical cosmetic criteria is satisfied. Now to optimize the value that we deliver to our customer, the biggest question is, how do we make sure that quality issues are found sooner rather than later? Well, it's easy. First, it's by inspecting the product continuously and reviewing the work while it's being developed. And the other way is by doing testing upfront during the development cycle so we can prevent excessive rework, schedule delays, and cost overruns, which might occur later on in the project. And this ties into what's called the cost of change curve. If an issue is found during the later phases of a project, for example, testing instead of during the design phase, it will take significantly more costs to correct that defect because so much development work has already been performed with design and manufacturing. So to fix this, 
we have to build quality into our process the first time and involve our quality team much earlier on during design and development. So to make sure that you're focused on optimizing your product delivery of value to your customers and your organization, just ask yourself these four questions. Number one, is the project's intended outcome aligned with your organization's goals? Number two, continuously evaluate your team's progress and verify that you're on track to achieve your desired outcomes. Third, are you still able to achieve your project's benefits in the expected time period? And fourth, did you obtain feedback from stakeholders to make sure that they're satisfied with the product that you're creating? Now let's move on to domain seven, which is measurement performance. This is all about how we evaluate our performance continuously so everyone understands what our product status is and also so that we make the informed decisions using this data. It's important that we keep our measurements so we keep track of our resources, our costs, the status of our in-progress work, and also to forecast whether or not our deliverables are on track to achieving our intended goals and satisfying our customer's acceptance criteria. Now, there are five areas covered inside the measurement performance domain. The first one is defining the clear measures to make sure that the right things are being measured and being communicated to your team. The second one is establishing what variables and what metrics will be monitored. The third one is defining how this information will be shared with other people. And fourth, being aware of the pitfalls and the internal biases, which can influence how you analyze and report your data. And lastly, how you will use that data to make decisions to improve your performance. So to create effective measures, you need to establish what are known as key performance indicators or KPIs that will be monitored on a monthly or a bi-weekly basis with your team. The first type is a leading indicator, which is a metric used as a predictive measure of future performance. They lead to results because they show the progress that you're making towards achieving your goal. For example, the number of items which are in progress inside your backlog. The second type is a lagging indicator, which is a metric to measure past performance. Some common examples include your revenue, your profit, or how much product was produced. Other examples you can use for your project are the schedule and cost variance, the amount of resources that you used, or even the number of deliverables that were completed. Now the downside to lagging indicators is that they give insight too late to actually do anything with that data. For example, by the time that you find out that your revenue decreased the past few months, it's already way too late for you to implement corrective actions to gain back the profit margin that you lost. So it's really important to use both of those indicators, not just one, because it's going to help you keep your teams on track as you monitor your progress towards your project's goals. So keep in mind that the PMBOK guide does a very superficial glimpse into what a KPI is. So if you want to dive deeper and if you want to better understand how to develop leading versus a lagging indicator, then I highly recommend checking out this book called The Four Disciplines of Execution. And I'll include a link in the description bar for you to check out. I've personally read it cover to cover and it's something that I use in my day to day to make sure that my projects move in the right direction. If you want a high level overview, make sure you check out my other video where I review this in much more detail. Once you've identified what your indicators will be, it's very important that it meets what's known as the SMART criteria, which stands for the following. First, is it specific? Are you being clear with what variable or parameter you'll be measuring? For example, the number of items that are in progress in your backlog, or the number of defects that are being fixed. Second, is it measurable or meaningful? Is the metric that you're measuring meaningful towards achieving your business goals? You don't want to keep track of something that doesn't move the needle towards your project's goals or improving your performance. Don't waste your time doing non-value-added things. Third, is it achievable and was it agreed upon by all of your stakeholders, your team, and of course, leadership? 
This is very important because the goal has to actually be achievable given the constraints and all the resources that you have available. Do yourself a favor and set yourself up for success, not failure. The next one is, is the data you're collecting relevant and realistic? In other words, does it actually give value or is it being collected just because? And lastly, is the metric time bound? Meaning, is there a certain date that this will be tracked towards and will this information be continuously updated? Here's one example of a SMART goal that will be tied to a project. Create a training presentation for how to use software A that will be rolled out across three departments in the next 90 days to increase organizational adoption and engagement before the beginning of Q4 this year. In this example, creating the training presentation for software A meets the specific criteria. Rolling it out across three departments in the next 90 days, it's what's measurable and achievable. Increasing the organization's adoption and engagement is what's relevant, and the time-bound portion is tied to the beginning of Q4. I encourage you to play around with this and see if you can come up with your own SMART goals for your project or maybe for your own personal individual goals. To make this engaging, leave me a comment down below. What is one of your own personal SMART goals, either in your career or your personal life that you hope to achieve? Share with me your thoughts because I genuinely would love to hear from you. It could be become PMP certified in the next two months to increase your career opportunities and income earning potential before Q3 this year. Or it could even be travel to Hawaii with a budget of $3,000 for a one week vacation before the end of fall this year. By the way, if you guys have any travel recommendations, please share it with me in the comments down below. I'm currently planning a trip with my wife and we're still figuring out where to go this year so we can relax and just take that needed time off from work. So now that you've identified your metrics, it's time to define what exactly will be measured and how it will be measured. The PMBOK guide breaks these metrics up into seven areas for your project. You have your business value, deliverables, delivery on your work items, resource usage, stakeholder satisfaction, and baseline versus forecasted performance. Let's dive into the first one for business value. In a nutshell, the goal of tracking business value metrics is to make sure that the deliverables that we're creating are aligned with the business case and achieving our organization's goals. There are four metrics that you can use. The first one is the cost benefit ratio, which tells us does your project's cost outweigh the anticipated benefits? If this ratio is greater than one, we should not pursue the project unless there is a mandatory legal or a regulatory implication. The second metric is net present value, which is used to determine whether a project's expected financial gains will outweigh the present day investment and if it's worth pursuing or not. It considers the time value of money and it translates future cash flow into today's dollars. So what that means is it's the difference between the value of cash now versus the value of cash at a future date. The general formula looks like this. So in project management lingo, an investment with a positive net present value will generate positive cash flow and will be profitable. A negative NPV means that you'll be draining the cash from the business and you'll be at a financial loss. Pro tip, there's no reason to calculate this manually by hand since you can use Excel's formula called NPV to calculate the net present value over a certain time period. The third metric is the return on investment, also known as ROI. How large of a financial gain can we gain relative to a project's cost? The generic formula for ROI is your total benefits minus the total costs, and all of that divided by the total costs. It's very simple and easy to use, but it doesn't always tell the whole story since it doesn't take into consideration the time value of money. And the last fourth metric for business value is planned benefits versus actual benefits delivery. So 
This is exactly what it sounds like. You're measuring the actual benefits delivered versus the planned benefits that you identified from your business case. Did you actually deliver what you promised to do when you first started out with your project? The second area to dive into is deliverables, which could be anything tied to the creation of your products or the results from your project. Example metrics that you could track could fall into one of these three categories. For defects and errors, think of this as the number of defects identified or the number of defects fixed. For the second metric of performance measures, think of anything that's related to your product's physical features and capabilities. For example, you have reliability, accuracy, size, and weight. For the third metric of technical performance measures, are you building? Are you building components that meet the specifications per your drawing or your test protocol. Now the third area for metrics is the delivery on your work items. This could be literally tied to anything which is work in progress or WIP, and it's primarily used for agile projects. So several example metrics that you could track are batch size, cycle time, lead time, queue size, process efficiency, and work in progress. For batch size, how much work is being completed in one iteration? You could classify this based on the level of effort on the number of story points that you plan to finish during your current sprint. For cycle time, this is the amount of time that it takes to complete one task. A shorter cycle time means that your team is very productive, and if it's consistent across several iterations from the past few months, then what that means is you can predict your team's rate of work or velocity for future iterations. The lead time, on the other hand, is the amount of time that it takes from when a work item is added into the backlog to when it finishes at the end of an iteration. If an item has a really long lead time, then your process and quite possibly your team is not efficient and you'll have to find ways to improve this during your retrospectives. The next metric for queue size is simply the number of items that are in queue and in progress of being completed. Just keep in mind that this metric is usually compared to your WIP limit. The metric for process efficiency is used to optimize the steps in your process and also to find out how efficient you are based on non-value added and value added activities. It's calculated as a ratio between the value added time to the non-value added time in a process. Value added work is anything that corresponds to developing or verifying a product. Non-value added work includes any tasks that increase the wait time or it's not related to creating the final product. Keep in mind that a higher process efficiency ratio means that you have a very lean and efficient process, which is ultimately what you're striving for. And the final last metric here is WIP, which is also known as work in progress. This pretty much establishes how many items are being worked on at any given moment. You'll commonly track this when you're using a Kanban board or evaluating the number of user stories that are being completed by your team. The fourth area for metrics that you can use is what's known as resource utilization or resource cost. The first metric is comparing your planned resource utilization versus your actual resource usage. The second metric is comparing your planned resource cost versus your actual resource cost. And you wanna calculate either the usage variance or the price variance between these two numbers. So usage variance equals actual usage minus your planned usage, and your price variance equals your actual cost minus your estimated cost. So you would use these two metrics to better understand the variance between your costs and resources that are actually used throughout your project's life cycle. Now let's move on to the next metric category, which is stakeholder satisfaction. The four metrics that you can use are a mood board, team morale, a net promoter score, and turnover rate. A mood board tracks each team member's mood at the end of each day. 
using some type of emoji or even a color. The next metric we have is for team morale, which provides a little bit more quantitative data compared to that of a mood board. You survey your team and you ask them to rate a few statements on a scale of one to five with how they feel as being a part of the team. For example, they would rate these statements. I feel appreciated. I feel like my work contributes to the project's goals. And I am satisfied with how our team collaborates with each other. If these statements were all rated as a four or a five by your team members, then you'll know that your team morale is very high. Now for the next metric, we have the net promoter score or what's known as the NPS, which is pretty much, it's a way to measure the level of customer satisfaction and their loyalty to your brand. It specifically tells you how likely a stakeholder would recommend your product to another person. And the final metric here is a turnover rate of your team members. How many people turn over from your department on a yearly basis? If this number is high, the team morale will be very low. Now the final metric category is your baseline versus your forecasted performance. And we'll typically measure our planned versus our actual data. So for our schedule, we'll look at our start and our finish dates, our effort and our duration. In terms of costs, we'll compare our actual costs to our planned costs. So to go a little bit deeper, we can also use a few metrics from earned value analysis to analyze both our costs and our schedule and also to see if our project is running behind schedule or over budget. Before we dive into it, there are three earned value terms that you need to understand. We have planned value, earned value, and actual cost. Planned value corresponds to the monetary value that's associated with the work which has been planned to be completed by a certain date. For example, we've planned to spend $1,000 to complete the deck on this house. The next parameter is earned value, which represents the value for the amount of work which has been earned or what's actually been completed so far. For example, let's say that we're halfway with building the deck on our house. So our earned value would be $500 or the percentage that we actually completed multiplied by the task budget, which in this case would be 50% multiplied by $1,000. And actual cost is literally what it says. For the work that we performed, how much did the work actually cost? This tells you how much money you physically spent to execute the work. For our example, let's say that our actual cost to complete the deck on our house was $1,500. Now, if this sounds confusing or overwhelming, let me break it down with my own words. Plan value is how much work we planned to do. Earn value translates to how much work was done. And actual cost translates to how much did the work cost. Make sense? To help you better understand this, let me show you what it looks like on an earned value analysis graph with time on the x-axis and cost on the y-axis. The first line that we're drawing here will be our plan value. That's the monetary value that's associated with the work that we plan to do. The second line that we're drawing here is our earned value how much work was actually done. And our third line here is our actual cost incurred from doing our work thus far. If we look at time T right here, we can see that our earned value of $500 is less than our planned value of $1,000. Our actual cost of $1,500 is also higher than both these two numbers. So to analyze what this means, let's take a look at two metrics schedule variance and schedule performance index. Schedule variance or SV tells us are we ahead of schedule or are we behind schedule or are we right on track? We calculate SV by subtracting planned value from earned value. So in our example, SV equals EV minus PV, which equals $1,000 minus $5,000, which equals a positive value of $500. Since this is a positive value that's greater than zero, it means that we are ahead of schedule. 
If SV was less than zero, it would mean that we're significantly behind schedule. But if it equaled zero, then we would be completely on track. Now let's take a look at the Schedule Performance Index, or SPI. This is a ratio which tells us how efficient our schedule work is being performed. I personally like to think of it as how effective have we been at performing our work right on time. SPI equals your earned value divided by your planned value. So in our example, SPI equals EV divided by PV, which equals 500 divided by 1000 for a final value of 0 0.5. Since SPI is less than one, we are behind schedule. If SPI was equal to one, then we would have been on track. If, however, SPI was equal to a value greater than one, then we would be ahead of schedule. Make sense? Now for earned value metrics that analyze our cost performance, we could look at two parameters, cost variance or cost performance index. Both of these two measures are very similar to the calculations for schedule variance and schedule performance index. The only difference here is that instead of using planned value, you're using the actual cost in your calculations. So cost variance is the difference between earned value and actual cost, and it tells you if you're over budget or under budget. The cost performance index equals your earned value divided by your actual cost, and it tells you how efficiently your work is being performed to the cost of your work. Here's a quick summary of how to interpret these values. If CV is less than zero, then you're over budget. And if CV is greater than zero, then you're within budget. If your CPI is less than one, then you're over budget. But if it's greater than one, then you're also within budget. And definitely take a screenshot here so you have this for your future reference. I've done a quick walkthrough of what those calculations would be for our example, and I'll show them on our screen right here. So as a pro tip from me, whenever you're looking at an earned value graph to understand your schedule and your cost performance, here's how to do it very easily. If your earned value curve is lower than your planned value curve, then you're behind schedule because you've earned less work than you initially planned. If your earned value is also lower than your actual cost, then you're over budget because you've earned less than what you actually spent. Hope that makes sense. By the way, smash that like button if you're getting a lot of value out of this video and subscribe to my channel for more videos just like this. For forecasted metrics, there are four earned value concepts that you should be familiar with. Now, I wouldn't be too worried about memorizing them, but instead understand what they mean. The first metric is estimate to complete or ETC. This tells you how much will it cost to finish the last remaining work on your project. The second metric is estimate at completion or EAC. This is an estimate for your project's total cost to complete all of your work, given the current work which has already been performed. The next metric here is variance at completion or VAC, which forecasts the difference in your project's budget whether there's a surplus or a deficit when all the work has been completed. In other words, it calculates the difference between your project's planned cost at completion and your project's actual new cost estimate. And the fourth metric is to complete performance index or TCPI. This defines pretty much how efficient we need to be to complete our project within budget. And it's the ratio between your remaining work to your remaining budget. Here's what these parameters look like when you show them on your earned value graph, right here. Now, two other techniques that the PIMBOT guide mentions to evaluate your forecasted performance is number one, regression analysis, which compares your input variables to your outputted information to create a mathematical relationship. And number two, throughput analysis, that analyzes the number of items that are completed within a specific time period. Now let's move on to the next area for the measurement performance domain, which is presenting information to your stakeholders. There are three ways that we can do this, using dashboards, information radiators, 
or vision controls. A dashboard is used to show a high-level summary of your project status to leadership, and it includes a few sections that highlight your key risks, issues, upcoming activities, and your project status, whether it's red, green, or yellow. Information radiators are typically used on agile projects and are known as low-tech and high-touch. And that's because they don't rely on complex software to be used and they should be easily created and updated manually. Think of an information radiator as a really big chart which should be visible to anyone in your organization, such as in a hallway or in front of the office to highlight your team's metrics and your project status. Visual controls are also similar to information radiators since they should be easily visible for everyone to see and they're specifically used to show the progress of a process with visual cues. Examples include a Kanban board or burn up and burn down charts. Kanban boards, they're a great way to visualize everyone's progress on a given task and there are usually different columns so you can see what's in the backlog, what's ready to be worked on, what's in progress, and what's already completed. Now a burn up or a burn down chart shows a team's velocity based on the work that's been completed so far. Now when I say velocity, I'm referring to the rate that the team completes each deliverable. If you're taking your PMP or your CAPM exam, it's very important to know the difference between a burn up and a burn down chart. Just know this exact difference. A burn down chart shows how many story points or work is remaining to be completed, while a burn up chart shows the work that has already been completed. On the X axis will be the days that have been progressed and your Y axis will be your story points. The next area of the measurement performance domain is being aware of the pitfalls and the potential biases that could influence how you analyze and interpret your data. You don't want to accidentally skew your results or falsely portray your data to other people. So the first one is what's known as a confirmation bias. What that means is having the tendency to look for information that only supports your point of view. The second is being aware of the difference between correlation and causation. I've made this mistake personally myself on my own projects. So just because the data shows a relationship between two variables does not mean that they actually cause each other. For example, it is not always the cause that being over budget will lead to schedule delays. The third one here is demoralization. If you set unrealistic goals and metrics that aren't even possible to achieve, instead of motivating your team, you're going to end up discouraging everyone, which will make your team completely unproductive and less willing to do their best. The next pitfall is the Hawthorne effect, which in a nutshell is the fact that just because you're measuring something will typically influence how someone acts. For example, if you're collecting data on your team's output, this will shift the focus towards maximizing how many deliverables your team is creating instead of focusing on creating the highest quality product possible. So it literally is a continuously balancing act and something to consider. The next one is measuring the wrong metrics. Not every metric is worth collecting data on, and you do not want to measure the wrong things. Focus on measuring only the ones which will impact the business. And the last area is the vanity metric. They look good on paper, and they might even impress leadership, but they don't actually give you any meaningful information that you can use to make decisions. The last final area of the measurement performance domain is making sure that you use the data to make decisions to improve your team's performance. Before your project even begins, take the time to agree with your leadership and your team what your thresholds are for each metric that you're actually measuring. It could be tied to your project schedule, your budget, or the work items completed in every single sprint. That way, during your project's actual execution, you can identify when your actual work is approaching the upper or even the lower thresholds of possibly going outside of bounds, and whether or not there's a possibility 
that you might be behind schedule or even over budget. So to wrap up this domain, ask yourself these questions so you're always aligned with gathering the right measurements. First, is the data that you're measuring reliable and giving you enough information to actually make decisions? As your project is progressing, are there any deviations from your planned baselines that can tell you whether you're behind schedule or over budget? And lastly, are your metrics showing that you're likely to achieve your project's goals? All right, so the eighth performance domain is tied to uncertainty, which is broken up into five areas, general uncertainty, ambiguity, complexity, volatility, and risk. All of these exist in any project environment, and they can pose potential threats or even opportunities that we as project managers need to navigate and lead our teams through. So I like to think of uncertainty as a state where you're not really quite sure what's going on and you don't know what steps to take next. Now, before we dive into how we can respond to uncertainty, it's very important to understand what causes this in our projects. Some factors include continuously changing regulatory requirements, any external market influences, new technology that's being explored, or economic factors, especially with the sourcing of goods and the pricing of materials. Just keep in mind that uncertainty can literally be found everywhere you look. Now let's talk about the first area for general uncertainty. We can respond to uncertain situations by using one of these strategies. We can collect as much information as possible by doing our research up front. We can plan ahead and brainstorm as many solutions as possible and keeping one as a backup contingency solution. Now, if you're developing a new product or a new technology, you can research multiple different designs and then you can vet out your ideas based on different criteria, such as cost, time, quality, feasibility, and risk factors. And the fourth strategy here is by encouraging everyone to be resilient. So that way we learn, we fail quickly, and we're more flexible to changing our plans. The second area of uncertainty is ambiguity, which is divided into two types, conceptual and situational ambiguity. Conceptual ambiguity is when you don't clearly understand what someone is communicating to you. You're literally using the same terms as someone else, but you're actually meaning different things. For example, if someone says that the schedule was on track last week, that's actually ambiguous because you could interpret this as either number one, was the schedule on track only for last week? Or number two, was it reported last week? So you see how just a minor switch up here can influence how you communicate things and not make it super clear. So to get around this, do your very best to be very clear with what you're communicating by aligning on terms and definitions. Now the second type is situational ambiguity which is when you're not certain which path or which scenario to follow because all these different choices are available to you. To clear up this type of ambiguity, you can do one of three things. First, progressively elaborate your plans and increase the level of detail as you learn more information in your project. Second, you can experiment with different ideas until you identify the true root cause or the best solution. And lastly, you can even use prototypes to determine which option makes the most sense to pursue. The third area of uncertainty is complexity, which is really any area in a project that is a little bit harder to control because of all the inherent intricacies and interactions between humans, the system itself, and the surrounding uncertainties. Unfortunately, there is no way that we can predict things with 100% accuracy. Even the people who predict the weather on a day-to-day -day basis are wrong, right? The news will say that it's gonna be super sunny and bright tomorrow, and then, all of a sudden, it ends up being super cloudy and windy. But hey, we can deal with the complexity in three ways. At a systems base level, 
reframing, and by taking a process-based approach. So to use a systems-based mindset, you can use two techniques, decoupling or simulation. All decoupling means is that you take apart the system and you separate out the components from the entire system. By focusing on only the component itself, you're decreasing the complexity down to the component level, which will be that much more easier to manage than the entire system all at once. For simulations, instead of having to vet out every single detail and every idea and investing hundreds of thousands of dollars, you can simulate different scenarios or components of what the overall system would look like. For example, let's say that your organization wants to build a new shopping mall in a growing city with different attractions and restaurants. To simulate what the customer experience is and what customers are looking for, you could research on the trends of other similar shopping centers. That way, you decrease the level of complexity and you leverage lessons learned from similar projects. Now to reframe your thinking, the first thing you can do is by incorporating a diverse range of perspectives and seek the feedback from multiple different subject matter experts. Don't just stick to one piece of advice, but instead ask for help from a diverse group of individuals. And secondly, you can balance the data that you're collecting and using. Don't just rely only on data that forecasts the future because it's just a prediction and it may not always be right. So find a combination of metrics that can tell you the whole story so that you can make better informed decisions. To use a process-based approach to decrease your project's complexity, there are three ways to do this. Number one, iterate and build upon the features that you are creating. After every iteration, identify what's working and what's not working and find ways to improve your performance. Second, always actively engage your stakeholders to get their feedback. And third, build mechanisms in place so you can fail safe. So if a critical component degrades, or let's say it malfunctions severely, which would completely disrupt your product's performance, perhaps your design could have a redundant component or a built-in safety mechanism which could mitigate the risk of severe failure. Now the next area for uncertainty is volatility, which basically means that you're subject to unpredictable changes which may negatively affect your project scope, schedule, or cost. To be proactive with this, we can use two techniques, alternative analysis or reserves. We use alternative analysis when we're evaluating different options against a set of weighted criteria and we're prioritizing the final result with this information. Using schedule or even cost reserves can be extremely helpful to address potential schedule delays or even budget overruns for delays or issues that were not foreseen in advance. And the fifth category for uncertainty is risks, which can either be negative or positive, but it's not known for certain whether it will occur or not. A positive risk is good because it's an opportunity that may have a positive influence towards meeting your project's goals. For example, an opportunity to accelerate your timelines or even decrease costs with procuring material. A negative risk is seen as a threat because they're likely to negatively delay your timeline or bring costs over budget. Every project has risks, and it's our job as project managers to proactively manage these risks with our team. How can we mitigate or even prevent them so our project is successful? Now what's even more important is understanding what the risk thresholds are and the risk appetites for each type of your stakeholders. Some people may be very risk adverse while others might be more willing to take on more risk to reap more benefits. So that's something to consider whenever you're engaging and communicating with your team. So let's first dive into negative risks, which are also known as threats, and also how we can better manage them using five strategies. The strategy that you use depends on two factors, the probability of the risk occurring and the impact that it would have on the project if it took place. Now for the sake of simplicity, 
we'll be categorizing the probability and the impact of risks into either high or low categories. So when you do it in this way, you can prioritize your risk strategies much more effectively. If the risk has a low probability and a low impact, then you'll simply accept the negative threat. That basically means what it implies, where we accept that there's a risk, but we don't take any direct action in response to the risk itself. However, it does not mean that we're just ignoring it. Instead, we might put these risks on a watch list and monitor them over the course of our project just in case the probability or the impact increases. If the negative risk has a high probability and a high impact, then we should do everything we can to avoid the risk, where we try to prevent or even eliminate the risk from happening. So some examples of this could be increasing the timeline if we know that one supplier is always having issues with delivery dates, or even de-scoping certain requirements because they're not realistic to achieve. Now, if the impact is high and the probability is low, or if it's somewhere right in the middle, then you might wanna transfer the risk to a third party. For example, working with an insurance company or asking a third party vendor to do testing for you. Now, the fourth strategy is to mitigate the risk when either the impact or the probability is high. Here, we'll decrease the likelihood of the risk happening or decrease the impact that the risk would have. For example, let's say that there's a risk that we might go over budget with building our design. To decrease the likelihood of that risk, we could proactively manage our project's budget and select much cheaper alternatives for our materials. When a threat is outside the scope of our authority, then we can escalate that risk up to leadership and management and they will be the ones responsible for controlling it. Now the strategies for dealing with the positive risk, they're also known as opportunities and they're very similar to how we deal with negative risk. If both the probability and the impact of the project is low, then we should accept the opportunity and not actively pursue it because that might not be the best use of our time and our resources. Instead, we can watch out for it and plan accordingly when it does. If both the probability and the impact levels are high, then we should do everything in our power to exploit and increase the probability of occurrence to 100% to make sure that it completely happens. For example, if there's an opportunity that a supplier will give a 30% discount on materials if we purchase in bulk, then we should do everything we can to comply with their request to save the funds in our budget. If there's an opportunity that has a high impact but a low likelihood of occurring, then we could share that opportunity with a third party vendor or even another group that's outside our immediate team and they could help us increase the chance that it would occur. If we want to increase the probability or the impact of an opportunity, then we might want to enhance and increase the likelihood of it taking place. For example, by adding more resources or even more funds to complete the work on time. If on the other hand, there's an opportunity that's outside the scope of our role, then of course we can escalate it up to leadership to help make that opportunity become a reality. So when you look at all the risk strategies as a whole, Here's what they visually look like based on the probability and the impact level. Keep in mind that these are only recommendations to follow, so tailor this as you best see fit for your project given its complexity, the size, and the importance to your organization. Now the other area that's important to managing risks is tied to management and contingency reserve. So when you hear the word reserve, I want you to think of a reserved amount of funds or time that's allocated to respond to risks and uncertainties in your project. A contingency reserve is allocated to address your known unknown risks or the ones that you proactively identify with your team should they occur. For example, allocating a scheduled management reserve of 15 additional days to your timeline in case feasibility test results do not meet the acceptance criteria. 
On the other hand, a management reserve is used to address a known unknown risk which your team didn't intentionally plan for. For example, extreme social or political changes which could negatively impact your shipment of goods to the United States. So in general, with this entire overview of risks, what's the most important to guiding your team to success is creating a rhythm of reviewing these risks, monitoring their status, and brainstorming and implementing planned risk responses should they occur. As a personal tip from me, do your best to incorporate risk discussions throughout your weekly project syncs. That way, your team is more proactive towards preventing roadblocks and even issues which could derail your project success. So to guide you on your journey to addressing uncertainty for your projects, ask yourself these questions. First, does your team act proactively before risks become issues? Second, do we have a process in place to identify and respond to risks in an efficient way? Third, are we doing everything possible to take advantage of opportunities to accelerate our project success? And lastly, do we have built-in cost and schedule reserves to address risks before they become issues? Let's now move on to the third chapter of the PIMBOT guide, which is all about how we can tailor our processes and our project management approach based on the organization that we're working for and the type of work that we're performing. Now, there are quite a bit of factors that you should consider, and they include the development approach, the life cycle and the types of deliverables that you're creating, the project's complexity and the size, as well as your organization's governance. So as you can see, it's so very important to tailor from the PIMBOT guide and not to apply the PIMBOT guide word for word or even exactly what it tells you to do. Instead, you want to understand the complexity, the size, and the organizational governance that you're working in, and then pick and choose the processes that best fit your project. If we tailor as needed, then we're going to be in a better position to maximize the value that we're delivering to our customers with the highest level of quality, and as a result, we'll be even more flexible and adaptable with our project plans. But not only that, we'll also be using our time and our resources so much more efficiently and only following the processes that make the most sense and are actually value added. Now there are five areas that we can actually tailor. It's our project's life cycle, the processes that we use, how we engage our stakeholders and the different tools, methods, and artifacts to manage our projects. For tailoring the project's life cycle, we have to decide what approach are we going to use? Will it be predictive, agile, or hybrid? For tailoring your processes, you'll have to figure out what element should we add, change, or even just remove. Are there any steps that we can blend together or that we need to realign so we use the same terminology so everyone understands what we're talking about? For tailoring how we engage our stakeholders, we also have to consider the skills and the experience level of all the people we're working with. We also have to make sure that we integrate and we empower those who we work with so they feel direct ownership over their work. And lastly, we have to choose the right software and the appropriate documents and templates to track and manage our project's progress. The process to tailor your project follows four simple steps. First, select the development approach that you'll use to manage your project. Second, modify your approach to suit your organization's needs. Then, modify your approach based on your project's context. So that could be its size, importance, and complexity. And lastly, as you progress throughout your entire project's lifecycle, always find ways to continuously improve your processes so that they're more specific to your team and your project. In terms of the development approach, choose whether you'll use a predictive, adaptive, or a hybrid approach based on the criteria that we discussed for the third performance domain earlier from this video. Some factors that you might want to consider are the product you're creating, the frequency that your product will be reviewed by your customers, the organization's culture, your team size, and your project's complexity. To tailor specifically for your organization's needs, you have to adhere to your organization's policies, procedures, 
and you have to choose the processes that make the most sense. Obviously, your organization is going to have a general overarching project management process that you can start with, so you can pick and choose which documents, which artifacts, or which tools and methods from the PIMBOT guide to incorporate. To tailor your approach for your specific project, there are three high-level areas to keep in mind. The product you're creating, your team, and the organization's culture. As we go through this, think of this as rough guidelines that you can ask yourself to identify what makes the actual sense when you're picking the different tools, methods, and artifacts to manage your project. For the first attribute of the product type that you're creating, there are actually eight factors you need to consider. First, how long is a project expected to take? Will this be a new technology that's being created? In terms of the overall market landscape, how fast changing is the market and what does the competitor landscape look like? In terms of your product itself, is it something that's super complex that involves software development and creating a future generation of new technology? Will it be something that could be created incrementally so feedback can be obtained in real time? In terms of the requirements, are these 100% locked in place or are they going to change over time? And lastly, how confidential must this project be and how strict must we adhere to all these different regulations and quality assurance activities? For the second attribute for the team to consider, evaluate these factors. What's your team size? Where is everyone located and where are they working? Is it remotely, in person, or maybe they're just scattered all across the world? What's your team's experience and how frequently will you interact with your customers to obtain their feedback? For the third attribute of the organization's culture, this is probably one of the most important ones because as Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast because no matter how well designed your plan is, it's going to fail miserably unless you have a team culture in place. So at the end of the day, it's your people who matter the most. So you have to make sure that there's buy-in from leadership as well as from the people who will actually be following their approach. Are they accepting and supportive of it? Is there a high level of trust among your entire team? And do they feel empowered to take on that work and make their own decisions? And lastly, do the organization's values and culture align with using the approach? In other words, is there a culture of empowerment? or always having to check and always verify everyone's work? Or is there a culture where authority and decision-making is given to the team? Or is decision-making only delegated to senior leadership? And the last step here to tailor your project is to continuously improve your processes. Tailoring is a continuous effort, not a one and done activity. So use opportunities, which could be your stage gate reviews or your retrospectives, to keep your team engaged and ask for ideas on how to improve your current process. Remember this, okay? Don't just settle for the status quo. As project managers, we should cultivate a spirit of innovation and find ways to get even 1% better every single day. Now that we've discussed the tailing process, let's talk about how we can tailor the different performance domains to meet the needs of your project. As we review each domain, use this as a guiding light to shape your approach and the methods and artifacts that you use. For the first domain of stakeholders, consider these factors. First, how many stakeholders will be involved? Is it a small group of people less than 10? Or will this be a huge company-wide initiative involving more than 50 people? In terms of collaboration, is this a strong united effort with all stakeholders both internally and externally? And what I mean by that is, does everyone feel like they have ownership and that they have accountability to make the project a success? Third, what kind of software tools will you use to engage your team? Will it be 100% done through instant messaging such as Microsoft Teams, Slack, or email? And lastly, how culturally diverse are your stakeholders? This plays a huge, tremendous role, especially if your stakeholders are based across different countries, so United States, Asia, and Europe, and it's your job to keep everyone on the same page. For the second domain of team, where is everyone physically located? Is the entire team working in the same location 
or across different countries in different time zones. This will be incredibly important because if you're working with an international supplier based in Asia, you're gonna to need to time your communications and your discussions appropriately so you deliver the right message in the right way while also considering their cultural background. If you're leading a team that's culturally diverse, is there anyone who has special needs? Does a team need special training so everyone knows how to navigate and manage diversity? Another thing to consider here is, will everyone be working full-time or part-time on the project? This will also affect resourcing constraints and whether or not you need to negotiate with different leaders or managers. And lastly, is there already a predefined culture that you need to either maintain or improve? For the third domain of the development approach, have you decided which approach to use based on the type of product that you're creating? Will you manage this project by strictly following the traditional waterfall approach? Or will you develop the product in an iterative and incremental manner? Or will it be a mixture of both predictive and agile elements? But not only that, are there formal procedures and governance structures in place that you need to comply with? For the fourth domain of planning, there's actually quite a few areas to evaluate. For estimating your project's cost and your durations, as well as how you'll manage procurement with external vendors. Have you researched into what kind of organizational procedures that you must follow? Because that's going to be the starting point with how you're going to lead your planning sessions and actually how much tailoring you can do to support your project. In previous projects for your organization, how have costs and durations been historically estimated on both predictive and agile projects? Use this information as the baseline so you know how to plan your project appropriately given the environment that you're working in. The fifth domain is work, and you'll need to consider how knowledge will be managed and stored throughout your project. That way, it creates a much more engaging and a collaborative environment that will drive your team forward. Also, think about what processes make the most sense to use based on your organization's governance and structure and how you leverage lessons learned. The sixth domain is delivery, which is actually one of the most important areas to consider since it determines how frequently the customer will give you the feedback on the product that you're creating. A few things to keep in mind here. First, is there a requirements management system that you need to use? Second, are there procedures to follow to obtain customer feedback, their acceptance, and the validation of your product? Number three, what templates, what tools, and what techniques can you leverage from your organization? And lastly, will your project have continuously changing requirements? And if it does, what approach can you use to meet your customers' needs. The next domain is uncertainty. And this is all tied to risk management, which in my opinion, is one of the reasons why we as project managers are worth our weight in gold. Consider the following factors. What is the risk appetite and the risk tolerance for this project across all of your stakeholders? And second, how can we use a robust risk management process that allows us to identify and manage both positive and negative risks so we can increase the likelihood of our project success. The eighth domain is measurement. How are we going to measure value on our project and what metrics will we use to continuously measure our project's performance? It's gonna be very important to also align with your stakeholders what your leading and your lagging indicators are and how frequently you'll be reporting your project status to leadership. So as you can see, tailoring is all encompassing and it involves modifying all these different elements of how you manage your processes and engage your people so your project is a success. Let's now move on to the fourth chapter of the PIMBOT guide, which covers the different models, methods, and artifacts that we can use to manage our projects. Let's first dive into models. Now, think of a model as a strategy for how a process or a framework is explained, which we can then use to tweak or optimize how it performs in actual real life scenarios. The models that the PIMBOT guide covers are divided into the following areas, situational leadership, communication, motivation, change, complexity, team development, 
and a mix of different other categories. Starting first with situational leadership, we have two examples, situational leadership two and the Oscar model. Ken Blanchard founded situational leadership model two, which tailors the leadership approach to address an individual's needs based on their competency and commitment level. Competence meaning their knowledge and their skill set, whereas commitment is tied to how motivated that person is. So the different stages that leadership would evolve will go from directing, coaching, supporting, and finally delegating. The Oscar model on the other hand allows you to adapt your leadership style to help individuals who created their own individual plan themselves for growing personally. The Oscar model stands for the following five steps. First is understanding the outcome. What are the long-term goals that the person wants to achieve? Second is situation. Understanding the person's current skill level and their knowledge level. Third is choices or consequences. You want to work with your team member to identify possible paths that they can pursue to help them reach their goals. Fourth is action, helping them stay focused towards achieving the near-term goals so that the longer-term goal can be accomplished. And the fifth and final step here is review, where you meet regularly with your team member to discuss their progress towards their goal. The next model type is communication, and there are three examples covered in the PIMBOK guide, which are cross-cultural communication, communication channel effectiveness, and the goal of execution and evaluation. Cross-cultural communication is a model that's based on the premise that several factors from a person's viewpoint and cultural background both influence how a message is transmitted by the sender and understood by the receiver. These factors could be anything like a person's knowledge, the experience, cultural background, language style, and their way of thinking. The communication channel effectiveness model thinks of communication in terms of two variables, effectiveness versus richness, where a very rich communication means that information can be conveyed quickly across a wide spectrum. What it means is that learning allows for quick and real-time feedback, and there's much more of a personal and a direct focus with the other person whom you're speaking with. So as an example, a rich communication channel would be a face-to-face -face conversation, while a less rich communication channel would just be like a text message or an email. So going back to Alistair's model, we have this graph here. On the y-axis, you have communication effectiveness. And on the x-axis, you have the richness of communication channel. So in temperature lingo, it ranges from cold to hot. And on the graph itself, you prioritize the channels based on these two different parameters. Per Alistair's model, the best form of communication, which is actually the most effective and most richest, is when two people are communicating things in person, discussing and drawing things on an actual whiteboard. This is the hottest because it facilitates real-time feedback and giving direct questions and answers. Now the next richest communication channel would be two people that are speaking on the phone or video conferencing with the camera turned on so you can have virtual face-to-face -face interactions. But if that isn't possible, then the two next best options are videos, audio files, reading notes on a piece of paper, or an email message. Now these are much colder in terms of the communication richness and they're less effective because they're just one way channel and you can't obtain feedback in real time. The third model is Donald Norman's Gulf of Execution and Evaluation. This revolves around the idea that when we perform an action, we have expectations in our mind for what that action will lead to. If those expectations are not met, then there's a gap or what's called a gulf. So in this case, if it does not execute to your expectations, then you have a gulf of execution. For example, pressing the on button on a remote control should turn the TV on. If the remote control does not turn the TV on, it would not meet your expectations, so there's a gulf of execution. Now the gulf of evaluation is the difficulty level of understanding the current state of the system that you're working with and whether or not the action that it performed was successful. 
So going back to our remote control example, seeing the TV turn on when we press the on button easily tells us if our action was successful. So in this example, the gulf of evaluation is very small. Now let's move on to our next models for motivation. And we have the following, hygiene and motivational factors, intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation, the theory of needs, and Douglas McGregor's theory X, theory Y, and theory Z models. It's important to understand what motivates your team so you can better engage and lead the people whom you're working with. The first model of motivation called Hertzberg's motivation hygiene theory is based on the concept that job satisfaction comes from two factors. You have hygiene factors, such as your salary, AKA your income, your working conditions, and your supervision level. And the second are motivators, such as your recognition and having an internal sense of pride and achievement over your work. Motivation factors are typically related to workplace satisfaction, and they cover your intrinsic needs, such as wanting to feel achievement, recognition, growing in your career, and the fact that your work is meaningful and challenging. Now, these types of factors allow you to feel satisfied in your job. Hygiene factors, on the other hand, are not related to workplace satisfaction. However, they must be present so you do not become dissatisfied. For example, your pay level, your relationships with your colleagues, and the organization's structure and policies. If any of these two factors are lacking or missing, then you're more likely to feel dissatisfied with your job because your needs are not being satisfied. The second model of motivation is based on Daniel Pink's intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. His model is that extrinsic factors, such as salary and praise, while they only motivate us to a certain extent. After reaching that threshold, it's the intrinsic motivation which comes from within us that's longer lasting and much more effective. He breaks down intrinsic motivation into three overlapping areas, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is the feeling of having direct control over our lives and having the freedom to spend the time doing our own things. For example, the flexibility to work from home or working on new creative projects. Mastery is the desire to continuously learn and improve. And purpose is the need that we all have to make a difference and to work on things that are much larger than ourselves. The third motivation model is David McClellan's theory of needs, which is based on the premise that everyone is driven by three needs, wanting a sense of achievement, power, and affiliation. People who are motivated by power enjoy leading other people and having increased responsibilities. Individuals who are motivated by achievement enjoy accomplishing challenging and rewarding work. And those who are motivated by affiliation want feelings of acceptance and wanting to feel being a part of a team. And the last motivational model is McGregor's Theory X, Theory Y, and Theory Z. This is a full spectrum of how we are motivated as employees. The first one is Theory X, where we're motivated only because of the income that we earn and not based on the goals that we're trying to accomplish. The best way to manage with Theory X is by using a hands-on approach and a top-down heavy style. Theory Y, on the other hand, assumes that we enjoy working in creative environments and we're intrinsically motivated to do our best work. So the management style to facilitate this motivation would be through coaching and encouraging creativity with your teams. With Theory Z, people want a work-life balance and they value working in an environment where family and culture are equally as prioritized as the work itself. The management style for Theory Z would be an approach that recognizes individual responsibility and the happiness and well-being of the employees but one that also creates a strong company philosophy and culture. Now let's move on to the change models so we can better understand what does it take to evolve from a current state to a future state. The Pinbot Guide reviews five of these areas and they are the iterative model of managing change in organizations, Jeff Hyatt's ADCAR model, John Cotter's H-step process to lead change, Virginia Satir's change model, and last but not least, the transition model. The first model for managing change in an organization follows five simple steps. First, formulating the idea 
and the rationale for wanting to change. What will our future state be and why is it so important? This is where you want to establish the mission statement. The second is planning out the change and what activities need to be performed to reach this future state. And the third step is to actually implement the change and show that the intended goals were satisfied. Fourth, you have to manage the transition and solve any issues or problems that arise. And lastly, you have to sustain the momentum and maintain the capabilities from this transformation. The second change model called ADCAR explains the five stages that we go through when we're adapting to change. How many times have you ever wanted to learn a new skill or take on a new project that was a little bit outside of your comfort zone? Then you might be able to relate to a few steps from the ADCAR model. The first step is awareness, where you become self-aware that a change needs to actually take place. Second is desire. For the change to actually happen, you need to desire the change for it to take place. Once that desire is built up inside of you, the third step is knowledge. You need to get the knowledge and the skill set through education and in-person training to make that change happen. Step four is increasing your ability by practicing doing hands-on work and getting the coaching and the mentorship that you need. And the last step here is reinforcement through rewards and encouragement to maintain your transformational change. The third change model is John Cotter's eight-step process for leading change in organizations. The first step is creating urgency and establishing the need for change. Is there an opportunity or a threat that is driving this need? The second step is creating a coalition. And what I mean by that is, you wanna create a team of key leaders in your organization who will be your change agents and be the most influential based on their expertise, their knowledge, and their role. Step number three is to create a clear vision that summarizes what the transformation will require and the strategy to accomplish it. The fourth step is to communicate the vision with other people, taking a top-down approach from management to all the layers of the organization. Then you'll need to address and remove any obstacles. Step six is to create the short-term wins which will help create that initial spark and drive that momentum forward. The seventh step is to build on the change by setting goals to tackle in the future. And the last step is to anchor the change in your culture by sharing the new vision and celebrating success stories and testimonials. The next model is the Virginia States Here Change Model, which describes all of the emotions and the feelings that we go through as we deal with unexpected changes. Let's start by visualizing what this would look like on a graph with time on the x-axis and performance on the y-axis. Initially, we have the late status quo stage where everything feels familiar. You know exactly what to expect and everything is going smoothly. Then, all of a sudden, a foreign element gets introduced here, which sharply decreases our performance level from the original baseline. This could be a significant event, such as getting pulled into a new position, a reorganization of your department, or just getting laid off. It's a foreign element because it's not expected and it came completely out of left field. This foreign element throws you into the next stage of chaos where your performance starts to oscillate and waver continuously. It's here that you're in an unfamiliar territory and everything is unpredictable. Your performance drops and you're feeling stressed, confused, and uncomfortable. For example, maybe you're on the job hunt for a new position after you just got laid off from your previous role. You feel like no company wants to hire you and no one seems to be responding to your emails. While you're in this chaotic state, you might come up with a transforming idea that will help you make sense of everything and better cope with the change. Sometimes that transforming idea may come with that aha moment and all you can do is just try and see what happens next. So now your performance here is starting to increase and you're in the practice and integration stage where you're testing new ideas. You're beginning to learn rapidly and you're starting to make a lot of progress. You're making mistakes, but you're also learning what works and what 
doesn't work. And this eventually leads to significantly improved performance compared to your late status quo. And now you've reached the new status quo stage. This is where your performance stabilizes and becomes the new way of working. Take a screenshot of this graph here because it's super helpful with explaining the different stages that we experience whenever we're going through unexpected change. The fifth change model is the transition model, which gives us an understanding of what people go through psychologically when they have to embrace change. There are three stages of transition. The first stage is ending, losing, and letting go, which means that we go through a huge range of emotions from fear to anger, uncertainty, denial, and even resistance. After some time, we move on into the neutral stage where change actually takes place. It's during this time that people might be feeling mixed emotions of anger, resentment, and anxiety. But in general, there are two actions people take here. They start learning new ways of working and becoming actually more creative. And because this is a very big learning step, your performance will inevitably decrease. After this stage, you move into a new beginning where a new norm is established and you finally embrace the change. In fact, you feel completely energized by it. All right, so moving on to our complexity models, there are two that you should be familiar with. We have the Kniffen framework and the Stacy matrix. The Kniffen framework helps us put situations into five different domains based on their cause and effect relationships. These five domains are obvious or simple, complicated, complex, chaotic, and disorder. Each domain helps us categorize a problem or a decision so that we can respond in the best way possible. In the obvious domain, our cause and effect relationships are obvious and clear to everyone. It's here that there's typically best practices or steps to follow from a process or a procedure that tell you what to do when there's an issue. The decision-making approach to use in this domain is to sense, categorize, and then respond. In other words, first evaluate the situation, categorize its type, and then respond based on best practices or steps from established processes or procedures. In the complicated domain, there might be a range of correct answers or solutions that you could use. Not everyone can see the clear relationship between the cause and the effect, and you're working here in a realm of known unknowns which means that you're going to have to leverage the expertise of other people. So the decision-making approach to use here is to sense, analyze, and then respond. In other words, first evaluate the situation, then analyze what you know using the help of other subject matter experts, and then respond by applying good practices. In the complex domain, it might be nearly impossible to determine the one solution that will fix your problem. And this is where most situations fall into. These type of scenarios, well, they're unpredictable because there's no direct cause and effect relationship, and there's no obvious right answer. So the best approach here is probe, sense, and then respond. Try out different experiments and accept failure as part of the learning process instead of trying to control a situation and impose order. Be patient and just probe around looking for different situations and patterns. Then watch out for the patterns to unfold and determine which solution to pursue. In the chaotic domain, there's a ton of confusion and there's literally no clear relationship between cause and effect. This this is when there's emergencies and severe crises going on, and it's your goal as a leader to stop the bleeding. So in this situation, you want to create order and stability first. The best decision-making approach here is act, sense, and then respond. You need to take action first to stabilize the situation and address the most urgent issues. Then you sense where there is some stability, and afterwards, you respond by taking steps to pivot your situation out of chaos and into the previous domains of complexity. In the disorder domain, your primary goal is to collect more information 
so you can move into one of the other four domains and take the best action forward. The next complexity model is the Stacy matrix, which uses two variables to understand a project's complexity. First, you have the uncertainty of the requirements, aka the what. And second, you have the uncertainty of the technology that we'll use to create the final product, aka your how. So on the graph I'm showing here, we have the what or the requirement uncertainty on the y-axis and the how or the technology uncertainty on the x-axis. The y-axis shows a scale of how certain or uncertain we are with our project's requirements. The x-axis shows a scale of certain or how uncertain the route will be to achieve those goals. Now, as we move from left to right, we transition across four states. Simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic. So, projects which have a low level of uncertainty for requirements and technology fall under the simple category, and these are best suited to follow the linear, the traditional waterfall approach. Projects which have a low to a moderate level of uncertainty for both requirements and technology, they usually fall under either a complicated or a complex category, and those are best suited for an adaptive approach. And lastly, projects which have a high level of uncertainty are typically chaotic. Here, it's best to also use an adaptive approach, keeping your iterative cycles short to experiment and learn as much as possible with the customers while you're trying to build something. Let's move on to our next models for team development. And the PIMBOT guide covers two specifically. You have the Tuckman Ladder and the Drexler Sibit team performance model. The Tuckman Ladder helps us understand the different stages that a team goes through at work. On the y-axis, we have the team effectiveness. And on the x-axis, that's where we have the team's performance. So in the very beginning, the team forms, and that's when we're meeting each other for the very first time, starting to get to know each other and what project that we're working on. It's at this very forming stage that people avoid conflict and instead, we're playing nice with each other because we want to be accepted by everyone. The focus here is learning about the project's goals. As the project starts to feel safe, people's strengths, weaknesses, and even their personalities come out, and that's when they push the boundaries, which might result in all this kind of conflict. This is when we enter the storming phase, and you'll notice a sharp decrease in your team's effectiveness, and that's because people are pushing for position and power, and so the team might be facing a lot of turbulent activity here. This is when the team is starting to do the technical work, and there's a high likelihood that there's going to be a lot of conflict or even disagreements between your team members. As things start to cool down, the team begins to cooperate and support each other, and that's when we enter the norming stage. You'll see a steady increase in your team's effectiveness as everyone starts to collaborate and work with each other, resolve issues, and whenever a challenge arises. It's here that trust is also starting to grow and develop, and everyone's building a really good relationship with each other. As the team members become operationally efficient, that's when you enter the performing stage. The team has evolved into a well-organized, cohesive unit, and everyone is efficient and working together effectively. The team members are much more interdependent and they're resolving issues smoothly. Now this is the highest level of effectiveness that your team is going to have. Now as the project closes out, that's when you'll enter the adjourning stage where the work is completed and your team is released from the project. The next team development model is the Drexler Sibit team performance model. At a very high level, it breaks up team performance into two areas. The first is creation of the team, and second is increasing the team's level of sustained performance. The first stage with creating your team, it goes through four steps. First, starting with orientation and answering the question of why am I here? Each person needs to answer that question as well as what are we trying to do together? The second step is trust building, where the focus shifts towards understanding who are the people on our team and understanding what skills does each person bring to our team. 
The third step is goal clarification and understanding what the team's goals and vision are. It's during this step that the team will learn more about the project requirements, the acceptance criteria, and the customer's needs. The fourth step is commitment, which answers the question, how are we going to get there? In this stage, you're working with your team to develop different plans. So that's your project schedule, your budget, and your scope of work to develop your deliverables. With commitment built up, you'll spring into the second stage of sustainability and team performance. The fifth step here is all about implementation. Who does what, when, and where? This is a stage where your team is finally working together to create the deliverables. Once you've started implementation and your team is fully aligned, then you enter the sixth stage, which is high performance. This is when everyone thinks, wow, we're doing really amazing things here. Everyone's collaborating with each other and there is just this, this synergistic feeling that's driving even better results. The seventh and last step here is renewal, where you identify what work has been completed already and you recognize everyone for their hard work. If all the goals have been met, that's when you'll close out the project and release all of your team members. If any changes need to be made, this is also a great time to renew and improve ways of working and change past behavior. All right, so it's a new day today and we're going to get started by reviewing the other models that the PMBOK guide covers, specifically for conflict resolution, negotiation, planning, process groups, and the salience model. The Thomas and Kilman conflict model asserts that there are five ways to deal with conflict situations by viewing it from two dimensions. You could either be assertive in your approach or you could be collaborative and much more cooperative with other people. Now these two dimensions, they help us better understand the five modes that we can use to manage conflict. The matrix that forms this model is two by two with one overlapping sweet spot right in the middle. Now on the X axis is cooperativeness and on the Y axis is assertiveness. And assertiveness is basically the extent that people are going to force their will onto other people, which can lead to faster resolution, but a higher chance of friction and a lower morale with your team. Cooperation is the extent that people are willing to work together to solve a problem by weighing different points of view. Now, while this can minimize any fallout, it also takes a lot of time to weigh everyone's opinion to finally come to an agreement. Now, starting from the lower left quadrant, if you have a low level of both cooperativeness and assertiveness, then you might take a step back and just simply withdraw from the situation. This often results in a no-win scenario where you lose and I lose. Now, if you have a low level of assertiveness, but a higher degree of compromising and a willingness to cooperate, then you're much more likely to smoothen things out and accommodate. For example, if reaching your overarching goal is so much more important than being in disagreement, then accommodating and giving in to the other person will maintain your relationship and the goodwill that you have. Sometimes we just have to take the loss and just yield to the other person so we can do whatever it takes to make something happen. Now, if you have a high level of assertiveness, but a low level of cooperating and compromising, then you're going to compete with other people and you're going to force your will onto other people. In other words, it's my way or it's the highway. Now, this is best used when something severe is happening, the stakes are high, and you need to assert your own authority. If you are in a position of authority and it's a very critical situation that needs to be resolved immediately, don't be afraid to tell other people what they need to do. Now, if you have a high level of assertiveness and you're also very accommodating, then this is where collaboration will be your preferred conflict resolution approach. You'll want to incorporate multiple viewpoints from different people and come to a consensus and a win-win scenario. This can be very time consuming just to agree to one final solution, but it's a really great way to handle issues and bounce ideas back and forth. If you have a moderate level of both assertiveness and being cooperative, then you hit the sweet spot and you're willing to compromise. In scenarios where there's a give and a take, 
and you want to satisfy everyone without having to escalate all the way up to leadership, you can compromise so that every single person in the party gets everything that they want. The other approach that the Pimbak guy discusses is called confronting, where you treat the conflict as a problem to solve, but it's also important to maintain the relationship with the other person. Let's now talk about the negotiation model where there are actually three possible outcomes. The first one is a win-lose or a lose-win scenario. For someone to win, the other person has to lose. The second scenario is a lose-lose outcome where everyone competes with each other, we fail to compromise, and we end up being worse than we started. And the last one is a win-win situation, which obviously is the one that we desire the most, where everyone is satisfied with the end result. Now, we can reach a win-win outcome as long as both parties involved demonstrate character, we trust each other, and each party is willing to work together to find the best solution. Let's now talk about the planning model that was developed by a guy named Barry Bohm, which asserts that less upfront planning might actually deliver a better value in the long run from a risk analysis standpoint. So on the screen, let's draw this out on a curve where the risk level is on the Y axis and the time and effort invested into your planning is on the X axis. So if you invest a very small amount of time and effort into your plan, then the risk is that people will not know what they're doing and you'll end up creating a solution that the customer does not want. In other words, you'll have loss due to oversight, delays, and extensive reworks. So the risk here will be very high. Now on the other hand, if you invest more time into planning, then the risk of incorrectly developing a product that the customer wants will significantly reduce. And you can see that on the graph right here. However, there is another set of risks to consider, which is a loss due to the competitive market landscape and also a late return on your investment. The longer time you spend planning, the longer it's going to take for you to get that ROI back and the more market share that you might end up losing. So the goal with our planning is to find that right sweet spot for the optimal amount of planning. The process groups model organizes project management into the five following groups. You have initiation, which consists of the different processes used to create a new project and obtain formal approval of your charter. Planning is the second one, and it consists of all the processes used to define your project's plan, requirements, scope, and the work to create your project's deliverable. The third one is execution, which is all about finally performing to create your deliverables. And monitoring and controlling is the processes to track and review your performance against your initially planned baselines, as well as managing any changes which might arise. And the last one is closing, which is pretty much the formal closure of your project. Moving on to the salience model, this classifies stakeholders according to three attributes. You have power, legitimacy, and urgency. Power is having the influence to make decisions and having a high level of authority in your organization. Legitimacy, on the other hand, is whether your stakeholders' involvement is appropriate and if it makes sense or not. In other words, how genuinely involved is your stakeholder with your project? If they aren't legitimately interested in your project, then you probably should not spend your time discussing your project's goals or any issues with that person. Now, the third category of urgency is the degree that the stakeholder's requirements call for immediate action. Now, you want to use the salience model to classify your stakeholders and to prioritize those who have a high level of power, authentic, legitimate claims, and also urgency. Before we move on to the methods of the Pinbot Guide, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. Now, think of a method as a tool inside your toolkit that you can use to lead and manage your projects. On the screen right here, I'm showing all of the methods that are covered in the Pinbot Guide. But remember, this is only a reference and it's not intended for you to use every single tool that's listed in the Pinbot Guide. Just familiarize yourself with what these tools are and know when to use them for your project. The methods are broken up into four categories. You got data gathering and analysis, estimating, meetings and events, and others which don't necessarily fit 
into a specific category. Starting with data gathering and analysis, there are a total of 26 methods to collect and analyze data so we can make better informed decisions. Now let's go through each one. The first is alternative analysis, and we use this to evaluate different choices or strategies for achieving a specific goal. To do this, we first identify the different alternative strategies that we can use. Then we select the relevant criteria that will measure against each of these different choices. Some examples of criteria that you could use include cost, benefit, risk level, availability of resources, or the impact on the environment. Now keep in mind that this will be very project specific. Now afterwards, you'll make a scorecard and you'll rank each choice against each criteria. And from here, that's when you and your team will pick the most optimal strategy to move forward with your project. The next method is called assumption and constraint analysis, where you analyze what assumptions are you making when you're creating your project plan, and you're also considering the constraints that limit your project's level of assigned resources, time, or budget. Now, as a quick refresher, an assumption is anything that you believe to be true, while constraints, on the other hand, are generally true in nature, and they may not always be favorable to accomplishing your project's goals. An example of a constraint could be, you only have two assigned engineers on your project with a financial budget of $30,000 to procure all of your supplies. An example of an assumption could be, your supplier will deliver all of your built product on time within the next 12 weeks. The next gathering tool we have is called benchmarking. This is used to compare your actual products or your processes of your organization to that of another similar organization. For example, let's say that you're leading a project to improve the profit margins of a shopping mall center. To generate the data, you might benchmark your shopping mall to another shopping mall in another location and identify ways that you could either improve your mall's metrics and internal processes to generate increased revenue. Now, the third tool here is tied to business justification analysis, which consists of five different techniques. You have the internal rate of return, the net present value, payback period, and the return on investment. The net present value, or NPV, also known as the discounted cash flow, takes into consideration the time value of money by translating future cash flow into today's money by adding up today's investment and the present values of all of them. If your NPV is positive, then your project is positively cash flowing and it's worth pursuing because it's going to create value for your organization. At a high level, the internal rate of return considers what discounted rate is needed to create a net present value of zero for your project. It's the projected annual yield of a project's investment by considering initial and continuously ongoing costs into a percentage growth rate that a project will have. So the higher your IRR is, the more desirable your project will be. The payback period is used to determine how long will it take to recover our initial investment in a project. Assuming the income that you generate from your project is constant, then the payback period for your project is just your initial investment divided by your periodic cash flow. For example, if you initially invested $200,000 to purchase a machine and the project will produce a positive cash flow of $50,000 every single year, then the payback period will be $200,000 divided by $50,000, which equals four years. Now, the return on investment, or ROI, is the percent return on your initial investment, and it's used to calculate whether or not a project is worth pursuing. To calculate your ROI, it's actually pretty straightforward. It's equal to your expected revenue minus your investment, and all of this divided by the initial investment. So if your ROI ratio is greater than one, then that means you'll have a positive return on your investment. A negative ROI means that you're not going to be profitable, while an ROI of zero means that you'll have a no loss and no gain. So essentially, the higher your ROI, the better it's going to be. Cost-benefit analysis is an analysis tool used to weigh a product's benefits 
against all of its expected costs. Let's take a very theoretical rough example to show how this analysis would work and what steps you'd actually follow. These numbers that I'll be showing on the screen here are not meant to be accurate at all, but just for demonstration purposes only. For example, let's say that you're planning to expand your business by moving into a new building and you're hiring three additional engineers to develop a new software product. Let's say that these extra costs will be as follows. You have the cost to move into a new building, might be approximately $12,000 for the first year. Obtaining new furniture and decor, that could be about $10,000. The hiring cost for three extra engineers will be $210,000 and the equipment cost to buy extra computers and software licenses, that will be $3,000. So all of the total costs will be $235,000. For the benefits, let's say that by hiring three additional engineers and moving into a new office space, your annual revenue will increase by 40% because of the ability to create new products to launch to market. Assuming your current annual revenue is $200,000, your anticipated revenue increase will be an extra $80,000. An additional benefit due to the new space could be an improved 10% efficiency. So let's do 10% multiplied by three engineers multiplied by $70,000, which equals a cost savings of $21,000. Let's also say that the new software product that we're creating is expected to generate an additional revenue of $200,000 annually. So the total benefits here would equal $301,000. Calculating our benefit to cost ratio, we have $301,000 divided by $235,000, which equals 1.28. Because our benefit to cost ratio is greater than one, this would be a profitable project to pursue. The next data gathering method is called a check sheet, which is a structured form to quickly collect data in real time. For example, counting the number of defects based on its category over the course of the entire business week. On the screen right here, I'm showing an example of a check sheet that involves tallying up different defects observed during manufacturing from Monday through Friday. Now, we have the cost of quality tool, which includes all of the costs incurred over a project's life cycle by investing into quality activities while we're creating the product. This is broken up into four categories. You have prevention costs to keep defects outside of the product. You have appraisal costs to verify that your product meets the quality requirements. The next one you have is internal failure costs associated with finding defects before the customer receives a product. And lastly, external failure costs tied to defects found after the customer receives the product. The next data analysis tool is decision tree analysis, which helps us visually analyze possible outcomes and make a decision for which path to pursue using calculations involving expected monetary value or what's known as EMV. This sounds a little bit complicated and I think it's much better for you to see how it's actually used and applied. So let me walk you through an actual example here. So feel free to pause the video and take notes as we go through this explanation. In our example, let's say that you're deciding whether to create a new mechanical product from scratch or upgrade the current design which is already in the market. In our example, the decision that we need to make is, do we create a new product or do we simply upgrade? So we'll start by drawing a small square here to signify that this is a decision. And from this box, we'll draw two lines to the right for each possible solution. On the top line, we'll write create new product. And on the bottom line, we'll write out upgrade current product. And at the end of each line, we'll consider those results. Since we're not quite sure what the results will be, we'll draw a small circle to represent this uncertainty next to both of these lines. From each circle, we'll then draw lines representing possible outcomes. So in our case, the possible outcomes is that there might be a high market demand or a low market demand for the new product or an upgraded version of the current product. We're now at the step where we can decide which option will be the best path to pursue. We need to first assign a cash value to each possible outcome. So we'll estimate how much we think the market demand will be for either a new product or for an upgrade. Let's estimate 
that the new product will have a high demand of $1 million and a low demand of $100,000. For the upgraded product, let's estimate that the high demand will be $500,000 and a low demand of $50,000. Let's also estimate the probability for each of these possible outcomes, keeping in mind that each chance node must sum up to 100%. So let's estimate a 60% probability for the high demand and a 40% probability for the lower demand. Let's also include the estimated cost to pursue each option. So to create a new product, let's estimate the investment to be $200,000 and the investment to upgrade the current product to be $50,000. With this information right here, we can calculate the net path value, which is the estimated benefit minus the estimated cost. So starting with a new product, the net path value for the high demand will be $1 million minus $200,000, which equals $800,000. The lower demand will be $100,000 minus $200,000, which equals a negative $100,000. Let's repeat the same calculation for the second option of an upgraded current product, and we'll get the following numbers. For $150,000 for the high demand, and $0 for the low demand. So we can now calculate the value of our uncertain outcomes by using the expected monetary value formula, which pretty much is the probability that the event will occur multiplied by the impact or the net path value that it's going to have. So for your new product, the EMV for high demand will equal 0.6 multiplied by $800,000 which equals a value of $480,000. The EMV for your lower demand will equal 0.4 multiplied by negative $100,000, which results in a value of negative $40,000. So your total EMV for creating a new product will be the sum of these two values, which equals $440,000. Let's repeat these same steps for the second option with upgrading your design, and we'll get these following values. With that done, let's calculate the total EMV for your upgraded design and the result should be $270,000. So when you compare these two options at the decision node, the best path to pursue is a larger of these two values, which is the $440,000 opportunity with creating a new product. The next decision analysis tool that we have is earned value analysis and forecasting, which uses different metrics to measure your project's cost and your scheduled performance. Some examples include your cost and schedule variance, as well as your cost and schedule performance index. Refer back to earlier in this video for our deep dive into the measurement performance domain where we go through this in so much more detail. The next tool is called an influence diagram, which is a visual diagram showing how different variables influence each other. For example, let's say that we want to better understand how different factors influence our desired outcome of design freeze, which we'll draw right here with a hexagon shape. We have these following factors to consider. Technician availability, preliminary testing, preliminary design, calculations, and raw material. We'll draw each variable with a rectangle shape. So let's start drawing arrows to show the dependencies between each one. So here, technician availability, completion of the preliminary design, and availability of raw material, they all influence whether or not testing can be performed. Preliminary testing influences the results and calculations that you obtain. And these calculations directly impact your design freeze. Risks which could impact these variables include staff shortage, failing results, lack of material, and incomplete design. So as you can see here, it's a really great visual collaborative tool to engage your team and identify what things to look out for, especially in terms of risk planning and mitigation efforts. The next tool we have is a life cycle assessment to measure the total impact on the environment from a product or a service standpoint, such as the waste, processing, and transportation impact. A make or buy analysis is the next data analysis method that we have to gather and organize data about whether our product will be made in-house or purchased externally with other vendors. 
there is usually a standard make or buy process in your organization. So you'll have to evaluate your choices against different criteria, such as cost, vendor's financial and technological abilities, experience level, competencies, quality concerns, and reliability. The probability and impact matrix is our next tool that we can use to visualize the probability of occurrence for each risk and its impact should the risk occur. It's a really great visual tool that helps us identify which risk should be prioritized for mitigation efforts. Process analysis is our next analysis method that we can use to review different steps within an operation and to identify any inefficiencies, delays, or bottlenecks that could either be improved or eliminated. For example, looking at the different steps used to manufacture a widget and seeing which steps are unnecessary, result in unexpected delays, and which ones could be streamlined even further. Regression analysis is a statistical analytical technique that we can use to determine the extent that a relationship exists between two different variables, such as weight and the force being applied. Reserve analysis evaluates whether or not the amount of reserve dedicated to your project schedule and budget is still enough to address the remaining risks that are still present on your project. For example, you might look at your entire project schedule and see how much reserve is still remaining. If you're only 25% of the way through your project and you've already used up 80% of your reserve, this actually might be a problem and you might need to rebaseline your entire project with management's approval. Root cause analysis or RCA is a technique that we can use to determine the underlying cause behind an issue and tracing it to its actual origin. One way we can do this is by using the five whys approach where we repeat the question why five times. For example, let's say that our vendor shipment was received five days behind schedule. Why did that occur? Well, the machine was not available. Why? They were overbooked with manufacturing orders for our other project. Why? Well, our supply chain counterparts prioritized other orders instead of the one for our team. Why? We didn't coordinate and prioritize the projects internally. Why? Well, we didn't analyze the dependencies across the entire program. Sensitivity analysis is another analytical technique to analyze the potential impact of risk factors on a project and determine which one has the greatest potential of an impact. And to do that, we'll use what's called a tornado diagram, and it's going to look something like this. On the y-axis are the list of risks that we identified as a team. And on the x-axis is the impact on your project's budget or even the correlation to your project's schedule. It's going to depend on what you want to measure. So let me first explain why the tornado diagram is so helpful. For our example, here are five risk factors with their quantitative analysis. When we're determining the impact of a risk, we're usually only using one absolute number from zero all the way to one. In reality though, a risk impact usually has a range or what's called a sensitivity that's tied to it. Hence the name sensitivity analysis. For example, the risk that parts might require redesign due to quality issues might cause a budgetary cost impact between $60,000 to $135,000 due to the amount of research, design, and scrap and rework efforts that might be involved. And all of this depends on the severity of your issue. So our tornado diagram helps us see a better, truer picture of what the risk impact would look like by considering the ranges and prioritizing it top down. And I'll show on the screen here an example of what a tornado diagram looks like with our previous example. The next analytical technique that we can use are called simulations to show the combined effects of risks to evaluate their likely impact on our project's objective. For example, you have Monte Carlo computer simulations to predict possible outcomes of an uncertain event. Stakeholder analysis is another tool that we can use to analyze our stakeholders using both quantitative and qualitative data. For example, you might categorize your stakeholders based on their power and their interest level and map them out using a power interest grid like the following. 
This will be super helpful so you know who to keep satisfied, manage closely, monitor with just a little bit of effort, or just keep them informed throughout your project. So this will be a very handy tool that you'll use, especially if your project has over 30 to 50 stakeholders. The next data analysis technique is called SWOT analysis, which stands for your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And you'll use this strategic planning technique to support a decision to evaluate the potential strengths and weaknesses of a project, or just to get a bird's eye view into how your team or business unit is performing. In terms of strengths, what do you do well in? What qualities separate you from other people? And what resources can you leverage? For weaknesses, what needs to be improved and what resources are you lacking? For opportunities, how can you best leverage your strengths and take advantage of current market trends? Is there a new need that you can address to help grow the company? And lastly, for threats, what negative risks could hurt your team's overall performance? Are there any emerging competitors or changes to the regulatory landscape? The next technique we have is called trend analysis, which identifies a project's current status and makes decisions based on that data. So in a nutshell, it takes data from historical performance to predict future outcomes so you can make decisions to bring your project back on track. Value stream mapping is another useful tool to visually analyze and optimize the different steps in a process used to create a product with the end goal being to maximize value and minimize any kind of waste. Variance analysis is another analytical technique that we can use to calculate the difference between your original baseline and your actual performance regarding your schedule and your budget. For example, your cost variance equals your actual cost minus your planned estimated cost. You could also calculate the difference between your actual completion date versus your planned completion date and see what that variance actually looks like from a schedule standpoint. The next analytical technique that we have is called what if scenario analysis, which helps us evaluate different scenarios to predict their effect on our project. For example, let's say that you want to understand these following three scenarios. What if the lead time for procuring our electronic components gets delayed? What if we accelerate our development activities? And what if we outsource only the outer housing to our vendors? You could vet out each of these questions with your team and discuss what the possible outcomes might be and how they would impact your schedule, your resourcing, and your budget. Let's now take a look into the next group of methods for estimation that are used to develop estimates for a project's work, time, and costs. The different estimating techniques that we can use are analogous, multipoint, parametric, relative, single point, and story point estimating. Analogous estimating comes up with a duration or a cost estimate by using similar estimates from another activity that is analogous in nature. For example, if you've previously procured parts from another vendor whom you've worked with in the past and it took you 10 weeks to receive those parts, then you could analogously use the same estimate assuming it's a similar component that you're purchasing. Multi-point estimating applies a weighted average to come up with a total duration for a cost estimate for an activity. One example is called the PERT formula, which calculates a duration estimate by adding up your optimistic value plus four times the most likely value plus the pessimistic value and all of that divided by six. Parametric estimating estimates the cost or a duration of a task by calculating it based on historical data and parameters. For example, if a contractor is paid $40 per hour to complete the pouring of concrete around your backyard, you can use that information to determine how much the entire activity will cost. If you know that it's going to take three hours to complete the pouring, then it should cost roughly $120. Relative estimating is typically used in Agile projects to estimate how much effort will be needed to complete a project's tasks. Scrum teams will use a non-numerical scale to compare tasks against similar previously completed tasks. So for example, you have t-shirt sizing, planning poker, or using the Fibonacci sequence. 
If you want to dive deeper into the Agile specifics for estimation, then I highly recommend checking out these books on the screen, and I'll include links in the description bar for you to check out. Single point estimation only provides one single value as a best guess estimate. Story point estimation is primarily used on Agile projects where each team member assigns a number of points of effort that would be required to complete a user story in that sprint. Now, the other estimation term that's included in the PMBOK guide is called function point, which is a unit of measurement that tells you the level of business functionality that an information system provides to a user. Affinity grouping is another method that we can use to group together similar items into their own category. For example, grouping together similar design ideas into category A, B, C, and so on and so forth. And the last estimating technique is called Y-band Delphi, where various subject matter experts go through multiple rounds of giving estimates individually. Everyone involved discusses where estimates differ and which one stands out, and this process keeps repeating until a consensus is finally achieved. And so, what makes the Wideband Delphi technique unique is that it uses an iterative approach to reach a consensus on estimates and make sure that everyone is able to give their opinions. Let's move on to the next method for meetings and events, which are used to engage your stakeholders. Here's a quick snapshot of the entire list. We'll break this up into the ones used for predictive, agile, or for both types of projects. The meetings that are specific to predictive projects are primarily a change control board, status meeting, and a steering committee. The last two might also be seen on agile projects, but I've seen them more often used on the traditional waterfall projects, but that also depends on the organization that you work for. A change control board consists of leadership and other key stakeholders who are responsible for reviewing, evaluating, and deciding whether a change request will be approved or rejected to modify our project scope, schedule, or budget. A status meeting is exactly as it sounds. It's used to communicate a project's progress and performance to management and other team members on a specific basis. So that could be every single month or every quarter. A steering committee is a meeting that's held with senior stakeholders to obtain their direction and approval on key decisions that are outside the authority of the project team itself. For agile projects, events that you'll typically be a part of are backlog refinement, daily standup, iteration planning, iteration review, release planning, and retrospectives. Now, as a side note, if you've ever taken a Scrum Master course, then these are all fundamental terms that you need to know by heart, especially if you're taking your CAPM or your PMP exam. Backlog refinement, also known as backlog grooming, is used to reprioritize the work in your product backlog before the next iteration starts. The daily standup, also known as a daily scrum, is a brief meeting that takes place every single day or at a frequency agreed by your team where each team member answers the following questions. What did I accomplish yesterday? What do I plan on working today? And what roadblocks or obstacles am I experiencing? Iteration planning, also known as sprint planning, is an agile event where all team members determine how much of the backlog can they commit to achieving during an upcoming iteration. You determine how many stories can fit within the next iteration and you break down the stories into tasks which your team will work on. The main goal here is you want to set a few realistic goals that you want your team to achieve in the next time box iteration. Iteration review, also known as a sprint review, is a discussion that you'll have with your team at the end of an iteration to review the work that was completed during your iteration. And the team will show the completed work to the product owner and other stakeholders to gather their feedback. Release planning is used to create a high level plan that maps out how a product will be released in increments. You plan stage releases of the increment and you spread this across different sprints. And you'll determine after how many sprints will result in a big software version that will release to market. A retrospective is another agile event in the form of a lessons learned that usually takes place at the end of every iteration. In a nutshell, 
you'll be finding ways to improve your team's way of working by going through some variations of these four questions. The first question is, what went well? In other words, focus on the big wins and the accomplishments from a technical or a team standpoint. The next question is, what went less well? Meaning, what are the areas and the gaps that need to be improved? The third question is, what do we want to try next? This one is about what opportunities or potential solutions do we want to explore and problem solve next? And the last question is, what is still puzzling us? This is about identifying challenges and roadblocks that we need to address. Now the meetings which you might see for both predictive and agile approaches are a bidder conference, kickoff, lessons learned, planning meeting, project closeout, project review, and a risk review. A bidder conference is a meeting that you hold with potential vendors before they prepare a bid because you want all vendors to understand exactly what you're looking for. So that could be your project scope, your requirements, and the deliverables that you're expecting. A kickoff is exactly what it sounds like. It's when you meet with your team and other stakeholders to formally kick off or start a new project or iteration once you gain approval from leadership. You'll use this meeting to align everyone on the next steps to share the goal of the project and to actually start the project's work. A lessons learned is used for the team to share the knowledge that they've gained and also to highlight any big wins that could be beneficial to the entire team. For example, lessons that you learn from working with the vendor and how best to negotiate pricing and collaborate with their proposals. A planning meeting is used to create and develop your project's plan. A project closeout is used to obtain the sponsor or the customer's final acceptance of the completed work before the project is officially closed out. The project review is a meeting that's held at the very end of a project to evaluate the value that you're delivering to your customer and also to confirm if the project is ready to be closed out, transitioned to operations, or ready to move on to the next phase. And the last one here is a risk review where you review the status of existing risks and you brainstorm potentially new risks that need to be monitored. So it's in here that you'll work with your team to find out which risks are still active, what risk responses still need to be implemented, and if any have changed in their severity or their likelihood of occurrence. Let's now move on to the other methods that the PIMBOT guide goes through. The first one is called impact mapping, which is really a strategic planning tool that helps you prioritize which features should be built into the product based on your business goals. The overall flow of how you create an impact map goes from your goal to your actors to the impact and then to the key deliverables. Let me walk you through an actual example right here. You first want to define what is the main goal that you're trying to accomplish, which is your why. Let's say that our team is creating a new fitness app on iPhones. Your why might be to increase your customer's usability experience on this new fitness app. Next, you identify who are the main actors or the main people who will influence achieving this goal. Think of this as who can help you produce your desired effect, who will be users of your product, and who will be impacted by it. For our example, our actors could be fitness enthusiasts, college students, and working professionals. Next, you define your impact. What action do you want out of each actor so they help us reach our goals? For our example, if we're trying to improve the customer experience on a fitness app, an ideal impact could be increased open rates of the app and increased daily usage throughout the entire week. Next, you define your key deliverables. What features do you want your actors to use to achieve the outcome? In our case, a feature could include iPhone notifications to remind them of their fitness goals, an online forum, a personalized fitness plan, and access to high definition exercise videos. The next method is called modeling, which is pretty much just creating a simplified representation of a complex system, which could be in the form of a storyboard, a prototype, or a sketch. The net promoter score, or the NPS, is a score index that indicates how willing a customer is likely to recommend your organization's products to other people. So 
On a scale from zero to 10, how likely would you recommend this product to your friend? The prioritization schemas are methods that you can use to prioritize the components of a project or a portfolio based on requirements, risks, or other features. Examples could include a multi-criteria weighted analysis or the Moscow method. In other words, what are things that you must have, should have, could have, and would have? A time box is a short period of time that work must be completed in. For agile projects, you usually have sprints that follow a time box window of two to four weeks. All right, so it's a new day today, and we're going to get started with the most common artifacts that we can use for our projects. Now, an artifact can be a document, a template, or a deliverable that's created during your project. And the Pinbot Guide, it breaks it up into these nine areas that I'm showing up on the screen right here. You have strategy, logs, plans, hierarchical charts, baselines, visual data, reports, contracts, and other forms of artifacts. So let's dive into the strategy artifacts first. The first artifact is a business case which explains the value that a project will bring and the financial justification for pursuing it. The next artifact is a business model canvas which essentially is a one-page summary which describes at a very high level your entire business model by analyzing each of these following areas. You have your key partners, activities, resources, your value proposition, customer relationships, the distribution channels that your customers will be reached, customer segments, the cost structure, and your revenue streams. Now the third artifact is a project brief, which is a very short document, and it describes your project's background, objectives, scope, timeline, and key deliverables all in one single page. That's it. It's very simple, straightforward, and it's not meant to be complicated. It's supposed to be a very condensed version of your project plan that you can quickly read, and I'll show here an example of what a high-level one should look like. Now, the project charter is different than a project brief because it's the document that formally authorizes the existence of a project and it gives you, the project manager, the authority to proceed with the project. It usually includes an overview, the scope, the schedule, all the required resources, the budget, and the stakeholders who are involved in your project. The next strategy artifact is the project vision statement, which is a high level description of the project's purpose and what it hopes to achieve. Now, the roadmap is the next artifact, which is a high-level timeline that shows where the key milestones are and where there will be significant phase get reviews and where critical decision points need to be made. Now, let's move on to the next artifacts for logs and registers, which both mean literally the same thing. These are used to record information about different areas of your project as you go through your project's life cycle. The first one, is an assumptions log, which keeps track of all your critical assumptions and constraints that are related to your project's work. For example, there could be assumptions tied to the procurement of your parts and the resource availability. And then you could have constraints which are tied to your funding limitations and the dates for reviewing your product with your customer. The next artifact is a backlog, which is simply a list of work that still needs to be done. In Agile projects, you'll typically work with a product owner who prioritizes this list based on the value that's being delivered to the customer. The change log captures this entire list of changes that have been submitted, approved, or rejected that could possibly impact a project scope, schedule, or a cost. The issue log documents all of the major issues that are ongoing and actively impacting your project's work. For example, Let's say that your testing results recently failed. So one of your engineers were assigned to investigate further into the root cause of this failure. The lessons learned register captures all the knowledge that your team gains while they're executing their work and identifying ways to improve their performance in the future. A risk adjusted backlog is a backlog that includes not just your usual features that will deliver value to your customer, but also the activities to manage and mitigate your risks. 
And of course, the product owner would prioritize this backlog with the highest value features at the top so that they're delivered first to the customer. A risk register is one of the most important documents in project management, and it's used to record information about risks that your team identifies throughout your entire project. You'll keep track of the assigned owner, the probability, the impact, the risk score, and the planned risk responses for each risk. The stakeholder register is a list of all your project stakeholders, and it also includes an evaluation of each stakeholder based on their influence, interest, or power level, just to name a few. Let's move on to the different artifact types for our project plans. I'll be showing on the screen right here the entire list of all the different types of project plans that you'll see. The most important thing that you need to know is that each plan outlines the strategy for how the work will be accomplished, managed, and controlled. For example, the requirements management plan describes how requirements will be gathered and controlled. The next artifact type is called hierarchy charts. These are visual diagrams which decompose high-level information into much more detailed information, and you'll typically see this in the form of a breakdown structure, as I'm showing on the screen right here. It breaks down an organization structure, a product's components, resources, risks, or a project's total work, aka the work breakdown structure. The next artifact type is a project's baseline, which is essentially an approved version of a project's plan specifically for the budget, the schedule, or the scope. The performance measurement baseline integrates all three of these. So you have the scope, schedule, and cost baselines, and it's used as a baseline comparison to manage your project's progress throughout its entire life cycle. One thing to also note is that the scope baseline is an improved version of three things, your scope statement, your work breakdown structure, and the WBS dictionary. The next artifact types are tied to how data is shared and presented in a visual format. So that could be graphs, diagrams, and charts. We'll go through this by reviewing the artifacts that are specific to the predictive, agile, or both approaches. For a predictive approach, you're likely going to use one of the following artifacts. Let's first start off with a Gantt chart, which is basically a bar chart that shows when tasks will take place and the durations for each activity, along with the corresponding start and finish dates. The Requirements Traceability Matrix, also known as the RTM, is a document that shows what your requirements are, the test case or the deliverable that is matched with your requirement, and the resulting status, meaning did it pass or fail the test. It's pretty much a tool that shows a clear thread for each requirement and its relationship to other artifacts. The Responsibility Assignment Matrix, or the RAM, is a tool that's used to clarify the roles and the responsibilities of each person working on your project. I mean, you need to know who's doing what so you don't overstep the boundaries. One example of this is what's called a RACI chart, where you show who is responsible to complete the work, who is held accountable to complete the deliverables, who should be consulted with, and who should be kept informed and up to date with the progress. Here's one example so you can see how to use a RACI chart in action. A schedule network diagram is a tool that's used to show the logical sequencing of activities that take place on a project. A stakeholder engagement assessment matrix helps us see what the engagement level is for each of our different stakeholders. Are they unaware, resistant, neutral, supportive, or leading? Here's a quick example of how you would capture each stakeholder's engagement in terms of their current level and what you desire them to be. A value stream chart is a visual guide that shows how materials flow through a process to create a final product and gets delivered to the customer. It's one of the Lean Six Sigma techniques used to optimize a process and identify where there's waste or non-value added steps. For agile approaches, you'll use one of the following artifacts that I'm showing on the screen right here. First, starting out with burn up and burn down charts. Make sure you understand the key difference between these two. The burn down chart shows the amount of remaining work that needs to be completed versus the time that's required to complete it. 
you'll have one line showing the actual task remaining and then another one for the ideal amount of tasks remaining. So as you can see here, it's a really great way for us to visualize whether or not we have enough time to complete the work for the sprint. A burn up chart on the other hand helps us visualize how much work did we complete so far in a sprint and whether or not scope changes have been added into a sprint. On the chart here, you'll have a line that tracks the work that's already been completed. In other words, the work that's already been burned. You'll have another line showing the ideal path to completion, which represents the total amount of work required to reach your sprint's goals, which in this case would be our ideal burn. The cumulative flow diagram is a tool that's used primarily with the Kanban methodology that shows how a project is progressing. It tracks all of the tasks as they flow through different stages, from the backlog to work in progress to done, so everyone can visualize the entire progress. On the y-axis is the number of tasks the team is working on for the project, and on the x-axis is time. The graph is divided into three color-coded regions. You have your backlog items, your work in progress, and your completed tasks. Here's an example of what this would typically look like. As you add new tasks, your to-do region would grow. And so when your team starts selecting items from the backlog to be worked on, then that will increase the WIP region by that same amount. So when those tasks are completed, then that increase then moves on to the completed region. The next Agile artifact that we use are called information radiators, which are pretty much large charts of information that are placed in a very prominent location so it can be easily seen by your team, your department, and other people in your organization. Examples could be a Kanban board or a dashboard. The lead time chart is a histogram which shows the trends over time of the average lead time of items completed in work. As a quick refresher, the lead time is a total time from when a work item is created or inputted into the backlog to when it's finally completed. Story mapping, also known as user story mapping, is a visual tool that's used by agile teams to outline all the different interactions that a user goes through for each feature that will be created. Since this visual tool involves using sticky notes to map out the product and its different features, it gives the team an entire holistic view of what we're creating. A user story map shows three types of actions. First is the activity level, which outlines the most general actions, followed by the steps to complete the activity. And the third level are the details, or the most specific actions. So user activities and steps are shown horizontally across the top, and then details for each subtask are shown right underneath it. The next Agile artifact is a throughput chart, which visualizes the number of items that your team completes with respect to time. The x-axis is a period of time, and the y-axis shows your team's throughput. Here's an example of a throughput chart for a team's work over the course of eight weeks. The next artifact is a use case, which is just a description of the different ways that an end user will actually use and interact with the system so he or she can achieve a goal. The velocity chart tracks the amount of work completed during each sprint. In the example that I'm showing on the screen right here, you'll have the story points on the y-axis and then your different sprints on the x-axis. You can see here that we're tracking the number of story points that we committed to complete versus the story points that were actually completed. We can use this velocity chart to determine our team's velocity and estimate our work for future sprints. Now let's move on to the artifacts that might be used for both the predictive and the agile approaches. The first one is an affinity diagram, which is just a diagram that helps us sort out large amounts of data into different related groups. It's especially helpful to organize results from a brainstorming session, improving a process, or when you're facilitating group discussions. Initially, when you're working with your team, you'll have a bunch of ideas that are scattered on the board. So to use the affinity diagram method, you wanna ask everyone to organize their ideas into groups that are similar. And this is what the final result should look like. The next artifact 
is a cause and effect diagram, also known as a fishbone diagram. All it does is it helps us visually brainstorm potential causes of a problem. We'll sort these ideas into the following six categories. Anything that pretty much is tied to measurement, materials, methods, environment, manpower, and machine. On the rightmost side of the diagram is the actual problem that you're trying to solve. And along the skeleton is where you write out potential causes underneath each category. The cycle time chart is our next artifact, which helps us visualize the cycle time of our completed work items. As a refresher, your cycle time is the time that you need to complete something once you've actually started working on it. So with the cycle time scatter plot chart, you have the cycle time in days on your Y axis and then your dates on the X axis. And over time, you'll add your completed items to your chart. So over time, you'll start to see a scatter plot of cycle time plotted against time. And it's a great way for you to forecast how long future work items would take. A dashboard is a group of charts and graphs that we can use to showcase to our team members and leadership about our project's progress and performance measured against specific metrics or KPIs. A flowchart, on the other hand, is a visual tool that helps us visualize the different steps that take place in a process or a workflow. Now, this is extremely helpful when you're identifying the inputs, the process actions, and the outputs of different steps in an operation. Our next artifact is a histogram, which is pretty much just a bar chart which shows data graphically distributed with its frequency or the count on the y-axis and the percentage on the x-axis. The prioritization matrix is a scatter diagram which helps us prioritize our work using a two by two matrix. On the y-axis is the impact level, ranging from low impact to high impact. And on the x-axis is the urgency level, whether it's a low urgency or a high urgency. So if an activity has both a high impact and a high urgency, then you're going to do the activity. However, if it has both a low impact and a low urgency level, then you will delete that task. But if it has a high impact, but a low urgency, then you will schedule it. On the other hand, if it's a low impact, but a high urgency, then you will delegate it. Our next artifact is a scatter diagram, which is used to show the relationship between two variables. And our last artifact for visualizing data is an S-curve, which displays the cumulative data for a project, such as cost or labor hours, all plotted against time. It's called an S-curve because the graph's shape forms a very loose S shape. This is helpful for us as project managers because we can see if there's a gap between our actual progress and the planned baseline curve. And if there really is a variance, then we can find ways to keep our project back on track. Let's now move on to our report artifacts, and we have three of them. The first is our quality reports, which track our quality management issues, non-conformances, and corrective actions. The second one that we have is our risk reports, which keeps a record of our individual and overall project risks. And the third report we have is our project status report to show our progress regarding our schedule and our cost performance. Let's move on to our artifacts for agreements and contracts. An agreement is a document that defines the intention between two parties. A contract is a legally binding agreement that obligates a vendor to provide the agreed upon product or service and for the buyer to pay for that service. The four types of contracts that the PIMBOT guide covers are fixed price, cost reimbursable, time and materials, and indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. Whew, that's a handful. <laughs> so a fixed price contract sets a fixed price for the product or the service that you'll be paying the vendor for. These are usually best suited for when a project scope is clearly defined so you have strong estimates with a huge amount of certainty and requirements aren't likely to change. Here's an example of a fixed price contract. You want a packaging design to be developed for your product and you're outsourcing this to a design firm who will deliver this in the next four weeks 
with a fixed price of $3,000. The next one is a cost reimbursable contract. This means that you're paying the seller or the contractor for all the costs that are incurred while they're working on the project, plus an additional payment, which will be the contractor's profit. You'll use this cost reimbursable contract when your scope of work is not clearly defined and requirements are very likely to change. For a time and materials contract, the customer pays for the exact cost of work that's being performed based on the hourly labor rate and the cost of materials. You'll use this contract typically for construction, software development, or project activities which are well-defined and finite in nature. An example could be a plumbing service that charges a $30 hourly rate plus an additional 10% for any purchase material. An indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract is a common contract type used by the federal government. It provides for an indefinite quantity of goods with a lower and upper limit for a fixed time period. In other words, the quantity of the products or services that the contract will deliver to you is not yet determined, so it's indefinite. The only thing the contract specifies is the minimum and the maximum quantities that you want. Other agreements that you might see are a memorandum of understanding, a memorandum of agreement, a service level agreement, and a basic ordering agreement. Let's now move on to the other remaining artifacts. The first is the activity list, which tabulates all the activities in your project with a description of the work that needs to be performed. The next artifact is a bid document, and it's used to request proposals from different vendors. So that could be a request for information, a quote, or a proposal. The next one we have is a metric, which we use to guardrail and monitor our project's performance. The project calendar is a calendar that identifies what the available working days and hours are for your project's activities. The requirements documentation is simply a document that tracks your product's requirements, the priority, and the acceptance criteria. The project team charter is another artifact that helps establish the team's values, norms of working, and operating guidelines. And last but not least is a user story, which is just the smallest unit of work for projects that are following an Agile framework. It shifts the focus from writing about requirements to actually talking about them by using a short, simple description of a feature that's told from a user's perspective. It follows this framework. As a user, I want some goal so that some reason can be accomplished. For example, as a site visitor, I want to access the shopping cart history so I can view what I purchased previously in the past. If you stuck with me this far, you have officially done it. You have reviewed the entire Pimbot Guide 7th edition and I want to personally congratulate you. I am so proud of you because this is not an easy feat and there was a lot of information to cover. I encourage you to go back, rewind, and watch any of the areas from this video that you're struggling with. If you want to master the most important concepts from the Pinbot Guide, download my free cheat sheet over at alvinthepm.com slash pm7 to fast track your path to passing your CAPM and PMP exam. To learn exactly how to pass your PMP exam on your first try, watch this video next and I'll see you in the next video.